right, we will get started. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Yuval Levin. I'm a scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute. And it is my uh, great honor and pleasure to welcome all of you to AI for this special forum to mark the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Um, the march took place on August 28th of 1963, so we're a little early marking the anniversary, and we decided to be a little early so that we could bring together people who will otherwise be scattered across a variety of events and celebrations this month. And as a result, we really do have an extraordinary lineup of sessions today, looking at the march and its legacy uh, and the broader civil rights movement from a variety of angles, thinking about what it has to say to us now in ways that are both timeless and timely. We're going to hear from scholars, from journalists, from policy thinkers, from religious leaders. Some of them are our colleagues here at AI, including our president, Robert Doerr, who has a lifelong connection to the civil rights movement and conceived of this event. And some are guests who have come to mark the occasion by thinking with us about the effort to live out the true meaning of the American creed and how it was transformed by the March on Washington and how it's going now in contemporary America. We're honored to have these guests with us and to have all of you with us. AI is deeply committed to articulating and interpreting and applying and living out that American creed. And this occasion is a wonderful opportunity to do just that. We're going to start this morning by considering the march itself uh, as a historical event, as a turning point in the history of the civil rights movement and in the history of our country. And to do that with us, we've got one of those honored guests, truly the ideal person to start with, Taylor Branch, the historian and author, whose three-volume history of the civil rights era is just an unmatched accomplishment on this front. The first book in that trilogy, Parting the Waters, America and the King Years, 1954 to 63, was published in 1988, won the Pulitzer Prize that year, uh, won many other awards and honors along the way. And with the second and third volumes in the trilogy, Pillar of Fire and At Canaan's Edge, the series has really won just about every imaginable award for a history book. It represents an extraordinary 24-year research and writing effort that I think of as just a great gift to our country. Taylor Branch will offer us the opening keynote this morning, setting the scene, and then he and I will talk for a bit. He'll take questions from all of you in this room before we move on to our second session on the legacy of the march. And so with no further ado, Taylor Branch, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Levin. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I, I couldn't say no to Robert Doerr. I was devoted to his father, uh, and did many interviews with him in the course of, of, of writing that uh, trilogy uh, all those decades ago. Um, and so I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, historians aren't usually associated with enterprise, um, at least often. Um, but I'd like to tell you that um, I grew up in a dry cleaning family. My, my dad was a dry cleaner, and in the, mid, the early 1950s, he, he had a, an MBA from the University of Chicago, uh, where he was the only honors MBA graduate with uh, Schultz, uh, who became Secretary of Labor. And he told me that the dry cleaning industry was heavily concentrated in the 1920s. Um, it, it was, there were a few mega companies that owned the dry cleaning plants in a, in a fledgling industry. And that in the course of the 20th century until he got in it, he said, much to his dismay, it got decentralized. It's one of the few industries in American history that has grown more decentralized through the course of history until um, entrepreneurs like my dad were displaced by uh, primarily Asian uh, entrepreneurs in the modern dry cleaning industry. So I claim a real devotion to private enterprise because my first job when I was five was putting the trouser guards on hangers that came in a box of 500 and you had to put the trouser guard on there. And I worked in that um, dry cleaning plant uh, every summer and many weekends uh, for my entire childhood in Atlanta, Georgia. So I have some enterprise before I got, um, before the power of the civil rights movement changed the direction of my life's interests against my will, um, merely because it was so tenacious and it raised such deep questions throughout my formative years. 
I was in the first grade the year of the Brown decision, and I finished college in the spring that Dr. King and Robert Kennedy were, were killed. Uh, so all in between, uh, the issues of race uh, going as deep as the Constitution and as deep as the scriptures, um, as, as Dr. King used to put it, um, were in my face and um, eventually changed the direction of my, I dropped my pre-med courses in the sophomore year at Chapel Hill in uh, 1966. I'm here to talk to you about the March on Washington. We're about to, we're coming on the 60th anniversary um, of a major event. The first thing I would like to say to you is that the March on Washington, like race itself, is largely a subliminal phenomenon. We don't really deal with and analyze. We're not inclined to bring to the surface the forces that govern our racial attitudes in the United States. The March on Washington occurred because of what happened in Birmingham in May of 1963. What happened in Birmingham in May 1963 is not acknowledged or studied very often, quite frankly, because it's too embarrassing to acknowledge the fact that the emotional core of the United States resisted in doing anything about racial segregation in the United States until the world saw photographs of small children being attacked by dogs and fire hoses on May 2nd, 1963. The backdrop of that is also not studied, which is that Dr. King, eight years after the Brown decision and three years after going to jail uh, everywhere from, uh, everywhere he went, but three times in Albany, uh, Georgia, had made no real headway, no real purchase on changing formal segregation laws um, in the southern states of, the, of, of our country. Um, and he feared greatly that the organized resistance to the civil rights movement um, was gaining ground historically and that, and that the movement was losing its window to accomplish anything lasting in American history. And so he designed and kept secret from his father and most other people, because he knew they would try to stop it, a great movement to try to confront uh, the heart of the beast, segregation in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, one of the most segregated uh, cities in America. And they trained for four or five months. James Lawson, who's still with us, uh, as far as I know, <laughs> um, he's still here, trained nonviolent volunteers for four months in Birmingham. And in April, they started um, daily marches down into the downtown business district to seek service, and they were instantly arrested. Um, and instead of building, which was the, the design and the core, um, the stories about what happened in the jail and what happened to the adult volunteers, no matter how strong their training was, meant that within two and a half weeks, um, they couldn't find any more adult volunteers. And they were on the verge of, of surrendering and leaving Birmingham uh, with Dr. King's uh, head tail between his legs. Um, the Kennedy administration actually offered him uh, foundation money if he would do that to switch to voter registration instead of confrontations uh, with segregation uh, in, in Birmingham. Um, and he, he had a real dilemma. But some of his staff, principally James Bevel and his wife Diane Nash, came and said, Dr. King, before we surrender, I know we can't get any more volunteers and a movement can't move without soldiers. We want you to know that our numbers in the nightly teenager meetings that occur after the nightly me meetings, mass meetings, have been growing. We have more and more teenagers who are willing to do something about it. Not only that, we have people, kids younger than teenagers who, who say this affects their future. And the rumor that Dr. King might be considering lowering the age for demonstrators in Birmingham seeped out into black Birmingham and caused a violent revolt 
among black parents who came to him and said, you came to Birmingham promising that you were going to bring liberty and freedom here in place of segregation, and now months later, you've left our jails full of people and horrible stories about what goes on in Bull Connor's jails. You have brought no freedom. There's been violence in the street. Many people have been fired. You're on the verge of losing, and now you want to leave our children with criminal records and obliterate any chance that they might have as black people in the United States of having a respectable life. How dare you? And, and James Bevel and Diane Nash got right up in their face and said, yes, these children are going to the, take these risks because you didn't do what you should have done to stop this. You didn't take any risks, and now they have to do it for you. And so Dr. King allowed Bevel and Nash to train people in the basement of the 16th Street Baptist Church, the same church that was bombed uh, a few months later, primarily for this reason. It's where the marches started to go downtown. It was just a few blocks. In the basement on May 2nd, instead of 12 straggling adults, out came 600 teenagers to the horror of the black parents who were across the street in Kelly Ingram Park. But as the teenagers marched, singing, um, I ain't scared of your police because I want my freedom to the tune of the old gray mayor and dancing, um, they converted the parents uh, who said, sing, children sing, as they were hauled off to jail. And the next day, over a 1,000 kids came out. That's when Bull Connor thought he was doing them a favor since they were kids, and by this time, even elementary school kids, mostly girls, as young as six years old, he thought he was doing them a favor by scaring them away because the jail was already full from the previous days. So he brought out the dogs and the fire hoses, and the kids didn't stop. They didn't run away. They marched into the dogs and fire hoses, and those images went all around the world. And they converted the emotional center of the United States where the average person like me who may be fascinated by the civil rights movement um, as a, I was then a, a senior in high school, um, but fearful of it because it was scary, made a transformation from somebody needs to do something about this segregation problem someday transformed from that to, I need to do something about this. And demonstrations broke out all across the United States. There were over 750 demonstrations within the next six weeks, leading to 14,000 arrests everywhere. President Kennedy was astounded that th there was even a picket line inside an Air Force base with the nuclear arsenal up in North Dakota, or wherever they are, South Dakota. He said, how the hell did that happen? My own soldiers are marching on this. But it was the subliminal effect of, of Birmingham that so changed the world that when King came out of Birmingham after a settlement was finally reached there, he found that the whole world had changed, that, that his, his schedule went from going to black church, from black church to black church, and preaching about uh, freedom and putting one foot in the Constitution and one foot in the Scripture, as he always did, and, and said, equal souls, equal votes, take your choice. We're talking about your fundamental values, and nothing would happen. What happened after Birmingham is that when he arrived in Cleveland, he was treated like an astronaut with a white motorcade through the city of, of Cleveland, and he gave six speeches in one day in white churches and black churches, and he told his aides, a, a week or two later, including Clarence Jones, we're on a breakthrough. I don't, I don't want, we need a mass protest. We need to go to the, go to the Capitol and, and, and take advantage of the fact that Birmingham has touched the heart of America. That's where the March on Washington came from. Um, and the other point I want to make about how race is subliminal is that the, the impact of the March on Washington um, is filtered 
through the lens of what the majority culture really wants to see. The truth of the March on Washington is that before it occurred, this capital was terrified. They canceled liquor store sales the whole week for the first time since Prohibition. The chief judge, Judge Lewis, had 14 judges, and he ordered them all to stop August vacations, come back in the city, and be ready to hold all-night bail hearings on people arrested for insurrection. The hospitals in Washington, D.C. stockpiled plasma. There were 4,000 troops ringing the city, and there were 15,000 paratroopers on high alert at Fort Bragg in case all hell broke loose when black people came into the city of Washington. And my favorite, because I'm an Orioles fan, um, and we all know how, how hard it is to get professional sports to cancel anything. Uh, when President Kennedy was killed later that year, they moved NFL games, you know, one day. Um, they moved my high school football playoff from Friday night to Saturday night. That's all. That was a, a concession. Major League Baseball canceled in advance Washington Senators game on the day of the march and also on the day after the march in advance, assuming that we would still be cleaning up the mess. The federal government gave its workers liberal leave not to come to work. And of course, what happened at the March on Washington is what we have processed, which is this immense relief and a joyous, I have a dream. You know, integration and black people aren't so bad after all. Uh, this, this was really something. But what we forgot is the contrast. We forgot where our subliminal uh, interest came. Life magazine said that Washington had the worst case of jitters before the march since the battle, the first battle of Bull Run, which was actually inaccurate because people before the first battle of Bull Run didn't think it was going to be a disaster. They thought it was going to be a picnic and, in fact, packed picnics to go watch the battle and had to come flying back into Washington uh, when the Confederates turned the tide at the first battle of Bull Run. But anyway, that's what they said. Afterwards, our news media had to, had to do a gigantic backflip, having predicted mayhem and disaster, to say that this was a wonderful Grant Wood-type patriotic event. I have a dream. And how did they do that? I'll never forget talking to Bayard Rustin about it. Uh, he said that he had never gotten any decent publicity. He was the principal organizer behind the march. Um, Bayard Rustin was a black ex-communist, out of wedlock, homosexual, who, who was denigrated by every standard in American life, and yet when the, when the march on Washington turned out so well, he was made the, arch he was made the wizard who transformed, who explained why Armageddon had turned into a picnic. And he, he, he confronted the reporters privately, and of course they never printed any of this, and said, I know why you're being so nice to me. He was, put, he was on the cover of Life magazine, the, the wizard of the March on Washington. He said, he said, now you are reconciled to me and you won't say any nasty things about me anymore because you were saying, I am the wizard who put porta potties all along the march and made all those Negroes nice enough for tea. And that's how the March on Washington came out. So these are just two examples of the fact that most of what we think and what we feel about race is not openly discussed. We don't openly discuss the fact that race largely determines whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. When I grew up in Atlanta, we'd never even heard of Republicans hardly. There were a few eccentric judges who were, who were Republicans um, because they believed in the two-party system that didn't really exist. It was a, it was a single-party Democratic monopoly and always had been. Republicans were scarce as polar bears. Uh, 
And then as soon as 1964 came and Barry Goldwater opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and Strom Thurmond switched parties saying that the party of our fathers is dead and worships at the foot of materialism and, and, and uh, all-consuming power in Washington. Therefore, I'm going to become a Republican. Republicans sprang up in the South out of nowhere, out of dust. And now the South is, the white South is presumably Republican. Uh, we forget that within four years after 1865, the Republican Party of Lincoln put the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments into the Constitution. And then we put the 15th Amendment to sleep for almost 100 years. Uh, this is the subliminal power of race. In my view, it, it determines um, more than we like to think. And our greatest challenge is to discover it and ask questions about how it does. Because race in our public discourse is almost entirely an accusation or a summary to get past it, rather than an inquiry about how we move forward and how race uh, influences uh, our dearly held beliefs. It, 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 it affects whether we're called liberal or conservative. And in fact, on that score, there, there virtually are no liberals. Why, for the last 50 years, 60 years now since the March on Washington, has the word liberal gone into hibernation? Well, I suggest to you it's because it was mercilessly whipsawed in the 1960s from the right by George Wallace, who said that white liberals were just as afraid of black people as, as white conservatives. He said that liberals in Washington were so scared that they had to build a new Theodore Roosevelt bridge over the Potomac River for all the liberals trying to get out of Washington. And he ridiculed liberals from the right. And Malcolm X ridiculed liberals from the left, saying, saying that they were part of the tribe and they, were, they mumbled and didn't know what they were doing. And as a consequence, the word liberal virtually vanished from our discourse to be replaced by progressive which in some senses is a historical flashback to what happened at the beginning of the 20th century when the progressive movement was popular in both political parties, the Roosevelt and Wilson. And to some degree today, a progressive is a liberal chastened not to talk about race by what's happened in the last 50 years. Meanwhile, conservatives cannot cannot say the name conservative too often um, to claim triumph for conservative ideas without acknowledging that in many respects as it, as it relates to equal citizenship, conservatives have retreated under protest from every advance in equal citizenship from the ones that put the first women into Harvard and Yale and into my alma mater, the University of North Carolina, which had no female students except nursing students when I was there. It was a white gentleman's university. Conservatives retreated from there, passed opposing um, the legalization of interracial marriage in 1967. And, and the idea of civic union or, or decriminalization of homosexual behavior was opposed by every conservative, even though in the rearview mirror today it looks incredibly tepid uh, in, a, in an era of marriage equality across, uh, across uh, gay and lesbian lines. So conservatives in many respects have retreated on all of these things and yet claim benefit of, of, of of profound ideas. And the reason for that, I think, to be confronted by honest scholars like yourself, is that conservatives have been able to win elections by demonizing the federal government that mandated equal citizenship um, since the 1960s, and that this, this demonization has, has advanced progressively. One illustration I will leave you with on, on the whole notion of liberal and conservative. Cons we need conservative, the, the whole premise of the United States, self-government and public trust is the key to the American experiment uh, and everything Madison ever said. <laughs>
conservative discipline and self-government in an individual sense and in a collective dissent sense is what we need. In 1963, at the March on Washington, there was not one single lottery in the United States. There hadn't been one since the Supreme Court finally obliterated the Louisiana Serpent, I think, in 1903, uh, setting uh, a constitutional precedent for um, public laws to govern uh, private behavior, in some senses, state behavior. There were no lotteries. The first state lottery was established with great restraint in the state of New Hampshire in 1964 in a movement led by the Manchester Union leader. Some of you know about the Manchester Union leader as a, in rallies for three goals. Number one, avoid having any statewide taxes by establishing a lottery. Number two, oppose the civil rights bill that was then pending in, in Congress. And number three, oppose the march of overbearing liberal government. And the first state lottery was instituted and approved in Massachusetts. They only had two drawings a year. Um, and you had, it was full of inhibitions because they knew that it was a really big deal to have the voice of the state government encouraging its citizens to buy lottery tickets in gambling that were a terrible bet. Both liberals and conservatives should agree that in a compact of citizens for the common good, to play your own citizens for suckers uh, is a fundamental step. Well, now there are lotteries all over the United States in these 60 years since the March on Washington. They are supported by conservatives because uh, conservatives hate taxes. They're supported by liberals because they want public funds for public purposes, and they're too scared to argue for them uh, in straightforward public elections. So you have a unity behind lotteries everywhere, and instead of being inhibited once every six months, as they were in 1964, you now have lotto games and jackpot bingos that change every 30 seconds um, because the progressive addiction of state lotteries advertised by public dollars and the voice of your government telling you to buy it. The DC lottery, I'll never forget it, when I moved out of Washington, the DC lottery said, um, he had a dream, it had a picture of Martin Luther King. He had a dream, play the lottery. Um, those voices are subliminally tied to race. Race is still at the heart. It's the barometer of our commitment to self-governing public trust in, in a government that is unique in human history because it, it is constructed to work on votes instead of the king's army. You know, every king, every dictator is the product of war and, and ultimately depends on violence. That makes... And, and democracy, as we know from January 6th, is a system that is, is designed to work internally without violence. That's the whole purpose. We commonly resist saying that the American experiment is an experiment in nonviolence. Dr. King talked about nonviolence. And when he talked about it, he said, what is a vote? It's a piece of nonviolence. But people want to think of nonviolence as something completely separate from our voting system, peculiar to black folks, because they have to have it. It's not peculiar. That's why uh, Dr. King's message was so central to the heart of, of, of American uh, democracy. So I want to leave these things with you. The United States needs desperately uh, innovative conservative dialogue about the place in discipline, uh, the discipline that we need to restore our belief in votes, to restore our, our capacity to do difficult things like confronting climate change, to look people in the eye across the ethnic lines that divide us and say, your vote counts as much as mine. What can we do together? We need all of those things uh, today. And um, we're not going to get there um, by papering over the fundamental issue of race.
That's the great thing that the March on Washington accomplished. But we need to remember that it, the first step was to put your children in jail uh, under, under attack from dogs and fire hoses in Birmingham. A very, very profound uh, psychological boost for American democracy that we don't often um, give them credit for. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for opening us up and, and putting a lot of issues on the table. It's interesting you ended up saying that the that in a sense the purpose of the march was to 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 make the subliminal uh, real to have to force people to see what was in front of them. Is that how the organizers of the march thought about its purpose? What was the purpose of the March on Washington? Did they feel like they achieved it a month later, a year later? Well, remember, um, uh, in the wake of Birmingham, uh, all those demonstrations that uh, when President Kennedy said, how the hell did that happen, uh, moved him. And I would, it would be a great movie scene. He, he made the one great civil rights speech of his life on June 11th, uh, 1963. It was the same night that Medgar Evers was murdered uh, after watching that speech. Mm. But what made it so remarkable was that he did it because these demonstrations were going along so, so much. They had no way of stopping them, and they thought that introducing a civil rights bill w w would be the best way of, uh, of, of regaining um, a, a sense of normalcy. He was, he was going to Berlin. He was about to say, ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, he was invested in the free world as, as a global enterprise, and here he is um, getting embarrassed around the world for what's happening in Birmingham. And he said he wanted to go on the air with two hours notice and no speech written and no congressional consultation. That's how extraordinary it was. And they were literally, come on, Burke Marshall, you, you must have some ideas uh, before he went on the air. And that's when he said, we are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is, it is as old as the scriptures and as clear as the Constitution, which is just like Dr. King, you know, one foot in the scriptures, one foot in the Constitution. So President Kennedy gave this speech and he had introduced the Civil Rights Bill. Now, so what Dr. King said is we're on a breakthrough, we need to have a national protest, but by the time they started organizing it with uh, Philip Randolph, uh, it, and others in New York, this bill was introduced. So the, the stated purpose it was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. But for freedom was to support the bill that President Kennedy was. I don't think he had submitted it by the time, of the, but he said he was going to. Um, they, were, they were working on it in the Justice Department. Mr. Doerr was working on it. What, what's going to be in this bill? Uh, President Kennedy said, you know, Public accommodations is nothing. You know, we do that in Boston. You know, black people go to the movies. So anyway, they were formulating this bill. And the stated purpose of the March on Washington was aimed at Congress pass the bill. Uh, that's what it was for. Um, and in fact, they said uh, over J. Edgar Hoover's wiretaps, uh, which is a great primary source for the history of this period, <laughs> They said, Dr. King and Clarence Jones said uh, over the air, we are glad that we decided to focus on Congress and not on the president because the president has come out uh, with an unprecedented uh, statement of the moral and political stakes uh, in the Civil Rights Bill in that, in that one speech that he gave. And how was, the, how was it received in Congress? How, what kind of effect did it have on Congress? Um, well, um, a few members uh, came and actually marched. One thing it's, it's kind of embarrassing to remember is that when, when they marched up to the, uh, to the Washington Monument, when the leaders marched, the men came up Constitution Avenue and the women came up Independence Avenue. Mm. They were divided by gender, even within the movement then. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's what it. That, that, that's what it was. But th they came up, and um, I'm sorry. What was I saying? The effect on Congress. Oh, 
Um, some members of Congress came, uh, marched with them, but very, very few. And there are, there are some um, embarrassingly overt racist comments in the congressional record put by a lot of, of, of Southern congressmen um, uh, about what was going to go on uh, and, and how these people were better off in Africa. Um, there, there, there's a lot of very, very embarrassing things. So it didn't really hit Congress with a wallop. They weren't, um, uh, they weren't eager uh, to get into this. You know, the, the legislative history of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, is quite remarkable. And the, uh, and the Senate filibuster, uh, which consumed you know, the whole uh, spring of 1964, um, is a remarkable event. You know, Senator Goldwater got, um, he decided to vote against it, uh, which was the same reason that um, he, he decided to, um, when, he, when he won the nomination that, that same summer, just a month later in San Francisco at the Republican convention. When he decided he was going to vote against it, it was a watershed for his whole career. And he consulted two lawyers on, on, on how to make the, um, the, how to defend uh, a vote against the Civil Rights Bill. Robert Bork uh, and uh, William Rehnquist. Those were his advisors on opposing the Civil Rights Bill, which is a pivotal moment for the Republican Party, uh, turning it from the party of Lincoln into the party of Strom Thurmond. Um, and, um, so it introduced, it opened a battle in Congress that, that went for a long, long time. I, a lot of people don't know that all during the, the filibuster in the Senate, Senator Russell, my senator from Georgia, who I met several times, um, was the leader of the Southern Democrats. And he had a big easel in the back of the Senate um, explaining his bill, the Racial Relocation Act, which said that the Civil Rights Bill unfairly targeted the South because most black people live there, and his Racial Relocation Act would ex export the proper number of black people from the southern states to the northern states to equalize the black population. So for each state, it had plus or minus how many black people uh, were going to have to were going to be moved as a result of his bill. Now, of course, it was a, a fan fantastic. Uh, bill, but he said, I've never been as serious about anything in my life and insisted that the easel stay there in the back of the Senate. So the March on Washington did not overwhelm, <laughs> did not overwhelm uh, Congress with a sense of purpose. Um, the, the Civil Rights Bill um, passed with a lot of sweat, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, sacrifice uh, on, on the part of Republicans and Democrats. You know, 80% of Republicans in the Congress voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in both houses. It was over 80% in the House. Um, the, the Civil Rights Bill wouldn't have passed without Republicans because the change that had been instigated um, uh, with, with Goldwater and Strom Thurmond and everything was just beginning. It, 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 it happened instantaneously in some places. If you look at the uh, congressional directory, for 1965, look at the Alabama congressmen. I think they had seven then. Uh, they never had any Republicans. Uh, five <clears throat> Democrats switched parties in the summer and got elected as Republicans instantly, and their biographies in the congressional directory omitted the word Democrat in all of their prior history and substituted party. So party chairman, so-and-so. Um, because that's how that's how sudden it was, and in other places, of course, you've got courthouses and everything that have that have been uh, uh, that are institutionally Democrat, and it took a generation for those to switch over. But uh, it, 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 it's um, it's a fantasy to say that it switched for any other reason than the racial realignment of 1964. There's no other force um, in our politics anywhere comparable to a force that can turn the partisan structure of the United States upside down, like race. Um, and um, so to discuss uh, fundamental things in politics, which we need to be doing today, we need to be asking questions. How does race fit in it? How does race affect 
mathematically, how does it affect representation in congressional districts? How does it affect uh, gerrymandering? These are, these are fundamental questions, but we, uh, we tend to skim over them. So you say that it wasn't, the, the effect wasn't overwhelming on Congress. Was it overwhelming in the culture? Did it, was it a big moment, received as a big moment? You know, the, the Civil War historian Alan Gelzo tells the story of having sat down to write an essay about how Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg was received yeah. and finding that it just wasn't. Nobody noticed the speech at Gettysburg that we now think of as a kind of turning point in American history. Yep. Was the March on Washington and was, was King's speech in particular understood to be a big moment the day after, the week after? Well, I think it varied. You know, the Washington Post front page the next day didn't have a word about it. Didn't, I, the New York Times had, I think, three stories about it. James Reston recognized it instantly. So I think, you know, it, it depended. It, it depended on, on, on who you were. It, it grew, of course, into the, into the culture so that uh, commonly now, you know, people simplified the civil rights movement to uh, Rosa sat down, Martin had a dream, and I'm free. You know, that's, that's pretty much, a, that's pretty much uh, how it came down. So it's definitely, I have a dream, I think is recognized um, by school children uh, everywhere. It is part of the culture, but I think it, 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 it took a while. Um, and um, for me, it was really amazing to study it because he wrote an incredibly stilted speech. This was the biggest event of his life. He knew that. And the speech that he, that he wrote and began to deliver was stilted, and he could tell that it wasn't going over. And a black preacher is sensitive to the audience, and black preachers are more or less like jazz musicians. They have riffs um, that, that, that they know how to work. And, the whole I Have a Dream speech was extemporaneous and something he had been delivering uh, in, uh, across the country. So it, it, to me, it's, it, it's a remarkable fact that what captivated the country was something that was not planned and something that he, that he did from pulpits you know, four or five times a day and hadn't been noticed before. Um, so the, the I Have a Dream, you know, Famously, it is said, and I could not document it, uh, but a number of people say it, that Mahalia Jackson was standing behind him and said, tell him about the dream, Martin, because he had just given the I Have a Dream riff in Chicago um, shortly before that. Um, I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I do know that it, I, you, you can see his text, and you can see where he deviated from it. And, and he deviated at exactly the right point because the next line, instead of I have a dream, the next line of his speech was, so let us go back to our communities as creative members of the International Association for Goodwill. You know, <laughs> it, you know and he skipped that line, you know, and, and we we're all better off for it. <laughs> you have a striking line in your book in talking about this saying that, that that speech, that moment, uh, transformed King and transformed his meaning for us. You say it planted him as a new founding father. Mm -hmm. um, and surely some of that was his self-conscious connection to the founding fathers, to the, to the, as you say, one foot in the Constitution and one uh, in the Bible, and the sense that what he was doing, what they were doing, was an extension, a continuation of, of the American creed. How essential is that to the kind of case he needed to make? And how is it that that argument, that way of understanding the purpose became as controversial as it did, as quickly as it did? Ooh. I think that's the most profound question um, going a, a, about the movement, is, is the, the internal debate within black culture and in white culture, too, as, as to whether um, uh, racial dialogue should be centered in kind of constitutional theory, or uh, or not, you know, uh, the Black Power movement said, "The hell with that." The, the founding fathers were all slaveholders. Uh, we believe in violence if we if need be, by any means necessary. But of course, King. Some of my, some of my favorite interviews were with Stokely Carmichael uh, after that, who said that ironically he and Dr. King became friends on on the Meredith March when he was blistering Dr. King with black power and the press was absolutely uh, head over heels in love with Stokely and saying that Dr. King was old hat. Um, Dr. King said, Stokely, I can't tell you to stick with nonviolence, um, but to me, you're saying that you want to step up 
how come black people have to be nonviolent and admi uh, the rest of America admires John Wayne? They don't care about uh, nonviolent people. And he said, well, Doc, Doc told me that nonviolence is a leadership doctrine. We're trying to move people up to nonviolence in governing between them. It's, it's, it's not where we want to catch up and be as violent as white people. Um, and so um, I, I think that it's essential to King's success, but also essential to our modern appreciation for, of the challenge for Martin Luther King that he devoted himself. He, he saw in the founders trying to create, even though they were slaveholders. But if you, and slavery is a system entirely based on violence. In fact, American race relations are, you know, a residue of violence between the races. That's all it was. There was no consent in slavery. It was based in violence. But King appreciated that the founders, who knew that slavery was wrong, that's why it's not in the Constitution, so on and so forth, said, if we even dream that we can have our relations across races on anything but violence, we've got to invent a system that stops us from killing ourselves. That's why we're in America. We've been killing ourselves in Europe for hundreds of years within white folks. That's the only kind of politics we know. So, you know, I, I think that where constitutional scholarship on race should start is where Dr. King started, which is how did the founders design something to move politics from a system of applied violence that determined people's loyalty, that determined what they were going to do, you know, until the next coup or the next civil war or whatever. Um, how do we move it from there to, to a system of self-governing public trust? It's a psychological experiment. It's a, you know, Madison said that constitutional theory is the most profound meditation on human nature. And I think Dr. King uh, uh, shared that. Uh, and he knew that Stokely was wiping the floor with him because, uh, because he was sexy and, and uh, there was an electricity uh, about him that was catnip to the American media and to black people who were tired. Stokely had been going to jail for six years. Uh, why, did, why should he have to keep going? And Dr. King kept saying, it's a leadership doctrine. Uh, stick with it. So. Um, in that sense, I do think that King and Diane Nash and Bob Moses and, and a number of the other uh, principal civil rights leaders were modern founders in the sense that they were trying to do the same thing um, the original founders did, which was to take an, a presumed, ingrained sense of politics um, that depended on violence and move it toward equal citizenship. Uh, so that, so that people could elevate uh, their politics in, into the constitutional system we have. Let's open up for questions here in the room. Uh, just please do ask a question, and also tell us briefly who you are when you uh, get started. There's a microphone going around. We'll get started right up here in the front. Just wait for the microphone, if you would. Who I am. My name is Joe Freeman. 1963, I was a college student in California who was inspired by the multiple events of 63 to join the Bay Area Civil Rights Movement. 65, I went south to work for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and included Smith there quite a bit of time there, including a few days in the Birmingham jail. I researched, I spent 12 years researching a very long book on all of that. And I came to the conclusion that it wasn't just the Civil Rights Movement which caused change in our cultural consensus on race, that it was also due to the role of the federal government, in particular, the role of the Civil Rights Division, which was headed by John Doerr, and the federal judges appointed under Eisenhower, who were vetted by Herbert Brunel. Now, you've written a lot on the Civil Rights Movement. I have one of your books right here and I've read most of the other histories. Why is the federal government left out of this equation? Am I the only one that sees its importance? Well, of course, the March on Washington was an appeal to the federal government. Uh, it was aimed particularly at the Congress to try to, try to get this 
try to get this passed, but um, the, the, the civil rights movement was very, very complex, as, as you know. There were civil rights lawyers down there uh, all over the place. The NAACP believed wholly in a legal strategy and, and really denigrated uh, demonstrations as something that were, that were dangerous, that would convince average white people that, um, um, that black people were lawbreakers. Um, um, Thurgood Marshall famously said that Martin Luther King was a boy on a man's errand and that he should be in court. So um, the role of lawyers um, and the role of the federal government were central. I mean, some of the most sensitive moments in the civil rights movement, when John Doerr showed up in Selma at Ms. Jean Jackson's house uh, uh, where Dr. King was staying, he had identical pajamas with Ralph Abernathy, and he was staying there, and John Doerr showed up and said, there is a federal injunction for you not to march after Bloody Sunday until Judge Johnson holds a hearing on what happened on the Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday. And, and people around Dr. King said, you're talking to the wrong people. We didn't do anything. You need an injunction on the people that attacked us, not on us. And, and John Doerr said, yes, this is a federal court order. I agree. If you want the federal government to enact a voting rights law, which is the purpose of the Sel Selma movement, we can't do it if you are in contempt of a federal order. You have to wait. The greatest illustration of the importance of the federal government, the federal judiciary, and the Congress, really all the branches of the government, King had to decide, am I going to march in defiance of this order on Tuesday, March 9th? A remarkable day in American history. Bloody Sunday was um, March 7th, okay? Um, March 9th in the morning, there were 2,000 people who had come from as far away as, as Hawaii before digital airplane reservations and, and to some degree before jet flight because King sent out telegrams saying, if you want to do something, come march with us from the spot where these people were beaten. It was on television. And they were all there, and they had all come all that way, and John Doerr is, telling, is asking him to tell them, you came here for nothing because we're not going to march. And there was a virtual hemorrhage within the movement between the hope of a partnership with the federal government that depended on obeying a federal court order and the cohesion of a movement that depended on the willingness of people to risk their lives breaking state law and tradition in the face of George Wallace. And so what did Dr. King do? He marched halfway, he, he marched across the Pettus Bridge and then said, we will go back to the church again. Uh, it was the famous turnaround march. And, um, and Judge Johnson examined him from the bench about it later. Uh, but it preserved the fact that Judge Johnson's order when it came out ordered protection for the, for the next march. And, and Lyndon Johnson called up George Wallace, are you going to do it or not? Uh, Wallace said no, so the federal government said we have to do it. And all of this was lined up. This is all about lining up cooperation and consent uh, for the federal government to do things that it had never done before. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just as Dr. King's um, fundamental outlook on the world is grounded in self-governing public trust, grounded in constitutional faith to move us toward um, a nonviolent politics uh, in, in place of the politics you have today in Russia uh, and most of the countries in the world. Just as it, it, it was that fundamental, it was also about how, how does the federal government move in areas of race relations given the fact that it's a, you know, it's, there are three branches of government. Dr. King was negotiating with all three branches of the federal government uh, in deciding what to do after Bloody Sunday uh, that produced the Voting Rights Act. Um, so yes, it was absolutely vital. And frankly, um, I think that it, had it been anybody other than John Doerr, it, it might not have worked. 
I mean, it's not easy to tell people who have come all this way to risk their lives, you know, sit on your heels for a week. And a lot of them, you know, the first nuns, they defied the Catholic Church uh, to come from all over this place, and they stayed a week um, behind um, uh, what was the, the sheriff, Sheriff Clark, and, and the police chief in uh, Selma put up a rope outside Brown Chapel there that they couldn't march and they called it the Berlin Wall. And, and all these nuns and all these people who had come from all over the place, all over the country, had stayed there patiently until the federal government in its good time uh, uh, arranged through the courts um, and through the federal government that when they finally did march all the way from Selma to Montgomery, uh, they had um, federal escorts, they had army helicopters, uh, and, and they made that march through Lowndes County uh, 54 miles uh, and, and, and arrived. So, yeah, the Civil Rights Movement is a profound interaction between all the branches of government, um, between law, politics, uh, and pulpit. Um, and, um, and Selma is a, is a supreme illustration of that. You, you had the, the Greek patriarch, uh, Yakobos, came all the way down there at a time when many Greeks were terrified of associating with the black civil rights movement because they wanted Greeks to be seen as white people and, and, you know, and not odd immigrants. Uh, but Yakovos went there anyway. Uh, I've never known whether it was Yakovos or Yakovos, even though I interviewed him. <laughs> uh, I, I still can't um, get it. But that's, uh, that's the range of this mo movement. So thank you for that question. Let's take another question. Here on the sign. Thank you for this fantastic talk. Um, my name is Nicole Pan. I'm a program manager here at AEI. I want to learn a little bit more about um, Dr. King's reliance on the Declaration of Independence. Was that rhetorical move long standing in his thought, and was it controversial within the civil rights movement? Um, in other words, was it seen perhaps as, were, were, the, the, were there those who critiqued him for using this document written by a white man, um, written at a time when slavery was widespread, or were, was this generally agreed upon as a, um, as a rallying point? Um, was there any controversy over the use of the Declaration of Independence? Yes. Um, not as much as you might think, but yeah, there, was, there, there were a lot of people who said, well, why are you quoting all those white folk? Well, they were slaveholders. As I said, there, there was some tension in the movement to dismiss the whole thing. Um, and, and, and yet, if you want something that's going to appeal to everybody across the lines in order to uh, realize fundamental change, you, you, you can't start anywhere else. Um, uh, Frankly, I think he studied the Constitution more than he did um, more than he did the Declaration of Independence. Um, but let freedom ring and those lines. You know, the "I Have a Dream" speech is a series of risks. You know, let freedom ring. Um, uh, I have a dream, uh, and with this faith, um, it, it was it was a series. Of, of them, and some of them were from the Declaration of Independence, and some of them were from more of the constitutional uh, era. We the people. Um, uh, Dr. King frequently uh, recited the preamble. Uh, if I had one recommendation to heal American politics today, I would recommend that every political debate begin with asking every candidate to recite, recite the preamble. It's one sentence, but it is breathtaking in its optimism and, and, and in its it, it, it scope for, what, for what's at stake and left to we the people, you know, uh, that's, that's where it's grounded. And the fact that it was written by uh, Governor Morris, uh, one of the great cynics uh, among the, uh, the founders, is a testament to his skill. Madison said that Morris's genius was so great that he could express other people's ideas better than they could. Uh, and that's what he did in writing that preamble. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful run-on sentence. Yeah. Take a deep breath. 
Well, we've, we're just about out of time. I want to ask you one last question. Uh, the, the, the first book in your trilogy, the book that covers the march, among other things, was published 35 years ago. Um, and there's a funny thing about legacy. It's not really stuck. It doesn't stay. It changes with time. How do you think now differently, 35 years later, about the legacy of the March on Washington than you did when you wrote it? Um, well, obviously, it looks like more of an early and somewhat naive baptism uh, than a culmination. Uh, at the time it happened, I mean, literally, people thought, this is over, you know, this is all over. Um, black people and white people are getting along. Uh, and when the Civil Rights Bill passed, uh, people instantly said, this is over. The, you know, uh, segregation applied only in the South. Uh, and Dr. King, ironically, Dr. King was in Boston within a month of the Selma March, uh, dragging his staff to say we have an opportunity to show that race is not and never has been purely a question of South. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an American question. So um, more and more it looks like a beginning hmm. of, of, it at least raised questions than what it looked like at the time. What it looked like at the time is this pretty much settles that. Uh, Dr. King can give a speech as good as anybody, and white people and black people were both dangling their feet next to each other into the reflecting pool. Therefore, that's the model for, for how Americans are going to get along. Uh, and obviously, that's naive. Taylor Branch, thank you very much for getting us started this morning. We appreciate it. <laughs>
back, everyone. It's good to see you all. Thank you for being here at AEI. Um, I really enjoyed that first discussion with Taylor Branch and, and you've all of in, and uh, we'll pick up kind of where they left off here as we start this, uh, this next panel discussion as part of this uh, great agenda that we have for you today. My name is Ryan Streeter. I'm the D Director of Domestic Policy Studies here at AEI, and it's my um, uh, privilege to be joined by these three distinguished guests on the stage where we're going to be talking about the legacy of the march that we just spent the first hour uh, getting the background and historical details on. And so I'm going to just do very um, quick one-sentence introductions and allow uh, my co-panelists to say more about their backgrounds as is relevant to their remarks, and then we'll allow them each to reflect on uh, the legacy of the March on Washington for today. Um, to my right is Jason Riley, um, columnist, well-known columnist at the Wall Street Journal for more than 20 years and also a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And to his right is Robert George, a veteran columnist and, and journalist with um, posts at Bloomberg and Daily News and, and other outlets. Um, I'm sure he's known to you as well. And then my colleague here at AEI, Ian Rowe, on the end, uh, senior fellow here at AEI, um, and also the uh, founder of a new network of IB, International Baccalaureate uh, Charter Schools in the Bronx, just as of last year. Um, so we're going to uh, hear from each of them, and then we'll have a discussion together, and, and be sure to allow time for questions from all of you before we wrap up today. But I'd like to allow each of the panelists just to take um, some time to reflect on the legacy uh, of the march um, for the past, present, and future, and I'll just kind of work my way down the row, if that's okay. Can I start with you, Jason? I um, think about the legacy of, of the uh, march in 1963 in terms of tactics still used today by um, civil rights leaders, people like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and the Black Lives Matter activists obviously copied King's direct action protest model, um, boycotts, uh, and so forth. But I don't think it's really worked uh, to the extent that it was uh, successful for civil rights leaders of the King era. And I'd like to point to two main reasons why that is. Uh, the first, and maybe we can get into this a little bit later, is that Jackson and Sharpton I think are fighting uh, civil rights battles that have already been fought and won. Um, the issue is no longer fundamental civil rights for blacks. It's more preparing and incentivizing blacks to take advantage of the opportunities that we have thanks to the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, which were King's crowning achievements. Uh, but the other reason is that King and his generation approached this work with the attitude that racism isn't going to be eliminated anytime soon, and that blacks must succeed notwithstanding it. I think the uh, civil rights leadership today takes the opposite view, by and large, which is don't expect upward mobility among blacks until racism has been vanquished from America. And they largely ignore black agency in that regard. And I'll illustrate this just with a short anecdote. A few years ago, I wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal on the prevalence of violence in uh, poor black neighborhoods. And in the column, I used to quote from Martin Luther King, who once said to a black congregation, do you know that Negroes are 10% of the population in St. Louis and responsible for 58% of the crimes? King said, we've got to face that. We've got to do something about our moral standards. He said, we know that there are many things wrong in the white world, but there are many things wrong in the black world too. We can't keep on blaming the white man. There are things we must do for ourselves. Now after the column ran, a number of readers contacted the paper and accused me of making up the quote, which comes from a 1961 profile of King written by the famous black author James Baldwin in Harper's Magazine. I was a little surprised by this because all you have to do these days is Google a quote to find the source. But what really struck me about the accusation is that those making it apparently just couldn't believe that the nation's most prominent civil rights leadership, civil rights leaders, I should say, used to speak this way about problems in the black community and the role 
of personal responsibility. Now, King was obviously a new, uniquely gifted and capable leader, and I'm not suggesting that black people today need another king. They don't. What I'm suggesting is that King represented a type of leadership, a type of thinking, a good faith approach to closing racial divisions that politicians and social activists today barely even give lip service to. King and his generation of leaders believed that whites obviously had a role to play in changing a fundamentally racist system. But they also understood that blacks had a role to play. And they were willing to hold blacks accountable despite the white racism, the legal and rampant white racism that existed at the time. They asked something of black people. And they operated under the belief and tried to instill in young people the belief that blacks must succeed notwithstanding these racial barriers, that blacks can't sit around waiting for whites to get their act together first. By contrast, many activists and politicians today who express concern about the plight of the black underclass ask almost nothing of black people themselves. They spend much more time making excuses for the kind of antisocial behavior that prominent black leaders of the King era regularly condemned. Young black kids are sent out into the world with a chip on their shoulders. They're told that the cops are gunning for them, that their teachers are racist, that the tests are racist, their employers are racist, judges and prosecutors, entire justice system is stacked against them. They're told that the world owes them. And if they don't succeed, it's not their fault. And so at a time when young blacks today are far more likely to experience racial preferences than racial prejudice, at a time when we have a generation of blacks who came of age with a twice elected black president, we have people in positions of influence and authority insisting that blacks can't be held in any way responsible for these persistent racial gaps until white, white racism has been essentially vanquished from America. And in many cases, you're dealing with black leaders and activists who consider any focus on black responsibility or accountability to be itself a form of racism. And the academic and political and media established for the most part plays right along with this. And I think this is one of the most important legacies of King and his approach to black upward mobility. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be on the stage here uh, with the, Mr. Rowe and um, Mr. Riley, my uh, um, brother from another mother. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's particularly good to be on the same stage because um, we can actually uh, finally um, determine that uh, Jason Riley and Robert George really are two different people. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we are 60 years removed from the March on Washington. Uh, the March on Washington, similarly, was 60 years removed um, from uh, W.E. Du Bois' um, stating that um, the color line was the uh, central problem of the 20th, of the 20th century. And in that, re in that regard, it's, I would make the argument that the, um, Du Bois to King is in, in, is in itself sort of a, a bookend of a particular conversation that was unique to the, uh, to the, 20th, to the 20th century. And it was just um, two years after that march, with one of the most uh, significant um, bits of legislation that was passed, the 1965 uh, Immigration and Naturalization Act, which I would argue um, began a change in the discussion of um, race and ethnicity uh, in the context of uh, the United States. And it's because of, partly because of that legislation that um, the legacy of the march has become far more complicated in the 60 years um, 
since the march, since the I Have a Dream speech, than in the 60 years um, prior to that. Uh, as my uh, colleague just said, there's much that must be said and should be said about the proper role uh, that um, blacks have in their own advancement, education, improvement, and, and so forth. But for, the, for most of the 20th century, that whole conversation, that racial conversation, it was, um, it was binary. It had to do with um, the remaining impact of slavery, Jim Crow, and so forth, and the role of whites in coming to terms with their role in that, and, and how they have uh, treated and mistreated African Americans. Uh, that conversation, that's not quite the conversation that's, that's, that's going on right now. Uh, we now have to deal with a very significant Hispanic population. Uh, in the context of the, um, of the recent Supreme Court decision, we now see the role of institutions making, um, judging, other groups purely by race and keeping them out of um, institutions in order for not to explicitly address prior discrimination, but just for a um, fuzzy concept of diversity. Uh, so it's in, that it's in that context we have to realize that um, the color line is now, is now blurred. Uh, it's um, it's not it's not it's not binary. It's no longer it's it's not just black and white. It's black, white, brown, Asian, and for many children um, who consider themselves biracial, you know, um, none of the above, for one of a um, for one of a for one of a better phrase. So. <laughs> That's, the, that's where the conversation is. Um, both Du Bois and King, their, their genius was in speaking to the nation as it was in their time, uh, in, the time in, the, in that time of, of a 1903, in a, 19, in a 1963. The, it, it, it wasn't, yes, there was flowery rhetoric. Um, but there was specific recognition of how African Americans saw themselves, how they were being treated within that within that specific within that specific time, and if we want to honor a, a true leg the, the true leg legacy of that march is to see how African Americans are within 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 this time, um, how they interact not just with whites, but also with Hispanics, with Asians, um, with, for want of a better phrase, the gorgeous mosaic of, of where America is right now. And to the extent, if we, if we are not looking at that question, if we're not looking at those, th those questions, um, we're ultimately not going to be able to resolve the larger question. Thank you. Ian. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, commemorating the 60th anniversary march in Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the full title. Uh, this event has personal resonance because growing up, my parents uh, often told us how during the 1960s, seeing television clips of the march on Washington had changed their lives. My parents were from, were from uh, Jamaica, West Indies. For them, the message of the march was that America was changing, that even though black Americans had faced struggles and the legacy of slavery, the march was a watershed moment for black freedom. And obviously, it was the catalyst for legislation like the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. For my parents, the legacy of the march was that opportunity existed in America, 
in ways that did not exist elsewhere. So when my parents decided in 1968 to emigrate to America, they weren't running away from Jamaica because it was a totalitarian state. They were running towards the United States to pursue the American dream. And thankfully for me, my parents made a great decision. Like many black Americans and people of all races who have thrived in this country, my parents followed a particular script for their children, as it was in 1963, as it is today in 2023, and as it likely will be in 2083, black children born into stable, married, two-parent households who also received a solid education and who also had a personal faith commitment have generally been quite successful even in the face of structural barriers. It is still the case, in fact, that the poverty rate for married black couples remains in the single digits as it has for more than 30 years. So for me, that is the legacy of the march that it helped to remove the legal barriers to freedom. But what still remains is the challenge to strengthen the cultural institutions that allow us, that empower us to actually exercise our freedom. Now, it would be remiss of us to not mention that there is going to be another convening of the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington in just a couple of weeks. And that convening is being organized by Al Sharpton and the National Action Network. And in an interview on, on the march, you know, Al Sharpton joked about the progress. Yes, black people have made progress. He said, yes. <laughs> We as black people, we can now fly first class and we can stay in a five-star hotel. But then he went on to say the, the, the true and shifting narrative, which is really about expanding the garment of victimhood. Sharpton said, quote, we must remember why we are still marching. The civil rights of black, brown, Asian, Jewish, LGBTQ Americans and women are under relentless attack. There is a concerted effort to undermine our democracy. There are many working week by week to peel away these rights, to take away our history. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us, end quote. It is a narrative of relentless oppression that I say expands the message of victimhood. So these are the two competing narratives, one of hope and agency versus the other of grievance and dependency that I think we all have to face today. And I do think it's instructive to close by sharing some words from Martin Luther King. Many people don't realize that the March on Washington in 1963 actually occurred on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. And a few months prior to the March on Washington, Martin Luther King spoke at the actual centennial celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation. This is what he said, quote, if our nation had done nothing more in its whole history than to create just two documents, its contribution to civilization would be imperishable. The first of these documents is the Declaration of Independence, and the other is that which we are here tonight to honor, the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, this quote, maybe he knew Val Sharpton's was born, but anyway, here's what he said. All tyrants, past, present, and future, are powerless to bury the truths in these declarations, no matter how extensive their legions, how vast their power, and how malignant their evil. The Declaration of Independence proclaimed to a world that had been organized politically and spiritually around the concept of the inequality of man, but that instead that the dignity of human personality was inherent in man as a living being." End quote. 60 years from now when we look back and again ask what is the legacy of the March on Washington, I hope we will honor King's message 
of hope and agency and dignity and personal responsibility over this narrative and of grievance and dependency that unfortunately is so prevalent today. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, Robert, Ian, for your, your remarks. Uh, let's turn to a disc discussion now about some of the things that, that you said. Um, you, you could say that all three of you have, have made comments that cut a little bit against the, the conventional wisdom grain or the common narrative that's in the media about um, barriers to uh, racial pro progress, progress in the black community. Um, so let's just talk about this issue of structural barriers. Are there, are there, are there structural barriers to black progress in America? And, and, and regardless of how you answer that question, maybe another way to think about it is if, if there was to be another march on Washington, um, we'll leave the jobs and freedom part of, out of that and say if you could fill in the gaps. If, if there were another march on Washington right now, what, what kinds of demands should there be today? Um, so you know, presumably there, there are real barriers that we still need to overcome. If we're gonna do a march on Washington, what, 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 what should we be marching for? Go ahead, Robert. Uh, I'll, throw this out. I'll, 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 I'll throw this out there uh, to start with. Um, first, Ian, thank you for um, you know, mentioning uh, um, the, the pathway that you know, your parents took coming here. Um, it was somewhat similar for myself, um, only slightly better because uh, my mother and I came from Trinidad instead oh, of Jamaica. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but putting that, putting, putting these rivalries, putting these rivalries aside. Um, we get Bob Marley. <laughs> we do better in the World Cup. Uh, <laughs> Eddie, Eddie, uh, but, um, but, but, and this is some, this is some, this is somewhat important um, because. Uh, um, uh, uh, I was raised. I was raised um, by um, by a single mother. Um, my mother, you know, finished um, her nurses finished her nurses training um, shortly shortly after I was born, and uh, we came f first actually from Trinidad to England um, when I was about a year old, and then came to the United and then came to the United States in just a few years after your parents did and. In, uh, uh, we came in, uh, 19, in 1971. Um, in that context, my mother's uh, focus was, uh, in terms of in terms of me, was 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 education, and uh, it, she was obviously working by herself. But she saw it uh, as being invaluable um, to put me into Catholic school, and uh, saw saw that as a uh, again, this is the early 70s, you know, long before the whole, you know, education wars and all of this other kind of stuff. She just saw, saw that um, coming first from England over here as uh, the best way, um, f you know, for her son to, um, to, uh, to, to succeed. Um, years later, I, you know, I still I went to a couple of public schools here and there, but primarily, pri primarily ca uh, Catholic schools. So um, while the data is absolutely um, correct that uh, uh, black children from in in intact families, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one percent. I just said I think one percent likely single digits. In terms sing of single single digits in terms of poverty. That's a, you know that's that's absolutely true. But that's not to say that, and we should obviously push policies um, to encourage that. But that's that said, it, it's it's not to say that. Um, Single parents, if they make um, education um, a priority, good schools a, um, a priority, whether it's parochial, whether it's um, whether it's um, a charter, uh, whether it's private, or or, or, or what have you, um, their children their children can succeed um, as well. So number one plank is whatever kind of um, educational um, choice and options. Um, th that has to be like I, I would make the argument that has to be the number one plank. Yeah, Jason. Um, well, first I wanted to respond to Ian quoting Al Sharpton as saying an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. I guess that's true if your name isn't Clarence Thomas. Uh, <laughs> but I, um, I didn't know Al. I didn't know Al Sharpton had an Article Five. That's the uh, that's the real. But. Um, <laughs> Um, 
The structural barriers you, you asked about, I think we'd all agree that there are structural barriers. Um, but it depends on what you mean by structural barriers. Um, <clears throat> Robert just mentioned families and schools. I think um, the family structure, the black family structure, uh, is currently a barrier to black progress. When you have 70 odd percent of um, uh, black children born to single parents. And when King gave that speech in 63, Two out of three black kids are still being raised by a mother and a father. Today, more than 70% are not. Uh, that's one big difference between now and then. Um, when the left talks about structural barriers, they're inevitably talking about uh, structural racism. Um, I don't think any of us would argue that racism doesn't exist. But whether it is a major barrier to black progress I think is, is, is undermined by uh, any number of factors out there. Um, uh, Ian mentioned marriage rates among blacks uh, related to poverty and how for the past three decades, um, you know, black married couples have had uh, poverty rates in the single digits. In fact, there have been some years when the poverty rate for black married couples has not only been lower than the poverty rate for blacks as a whole, it's lower than for whites as a whole. Um, so uh, is, is uh, poverty a function of racism, primarily, or a function of family structure and attitudes towards marriage? Um, and a final example I'll give you is um, uh, income. Uh, yes, it's true that uh, uh, blacks on average earn less than whites on average. But according to the 2020 census, there are more than 9 million black Americans that earn more than the white median. Um, I mean, that's a lot of black Americans. I think that seriously undermines the structural racism argument. I mean, whatever structural racism is out there, it can't prevent um, the country from twice electing a black president and a current vice president. Um, it can't prevent uh, 9 million black Americans from earning more than the white median. Um, so yes, there are structural barriers. I think the school system is a structural barrier uh, with too many black kids stuck in the worst performing schools in the country. That's a structural problem I think we could address. Mm -hmm. But those aren't the kinds of structural issues I think the left is talking about. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with Jason. In a lot of these conversations, it's often um, I don't know, for those of us more in the center right and how we think, you know, you're not acknowledging barriers exist, systemic and institutional. And I do think it's important to say, sure, there are barriers, but A, are they insurmountable? Um, or are they the, the types of barriers that I think Jason is referring to in terms of you know, deep um, systemic bias? You know, I opened uh, a network of new public charter schools in District 12 in the Bronx. And in the Bronx, in this, this District 12 of the uh, 2,000 or so students that started ninth grade um, uh, in 2015, uh, four years later, only 7% graduated from high school ready for college. Meaning that they started ninth grade and either dropped out along the way or they actually did earn their high school diploma in 2019, but still could not do math nor reading without remediation you know, if they were to go to college. And this is a district in which if you are a parent and you want to send your child to a good school, the only option you have are the schools that have historically been producing only 7% um, ready for college graduation rates because there's a legislative barrier. There's a cap um, that the unions have definitely influenced legislators in New York to essentially have a stranglehold over uh, choice, particularly in low-income communities, particularly in communities that are predominantly black and Hispanic. And this year, you know, Governor Kathy Hochul had the audacity to uh, recommend in her initial budget that she was going to eliminate that cap, even just for New York City, not even, not even to, for New York State, just to make it so that the 100 or so charters that were available in the state that weren't available in New York City could just 
be available to entrepreneurs who had great ideas. I mean, the, the wait list for charter schools in New York City is about 60,000 families. And so she made this announcement literally the next day. Very senior elected officials came, held a press, press conference, say that this would destroy public education uh, in New York, and it would be a travesty. And Governor Hochul quietly just went away and eliminated that proposal. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of black elected officials who were opposed to removing this barrier that would have created more educational freedom for low-income black and Hispanic kids. So is that structural racism when you have predominantly black leaders standing in the way of opportunity that would be created for young black kids who don't have opportunities? So this, this is real. So there are structural barriers, but we have to have the confidence to go out and say it, to um, acknowledge it, um, and then say the way in which we think about these things is very different, that whatever structural barriers that exist are perhaps um, a low percentage, maybe based on racial animus, sure, but the far greater um, reality that many of our kids face is barriers are political, um, they're familial, um, and that's what we've got to really focus on. When you look at geographic inequality in America, it's really changed over the last 40 years from kind of a um, racial segregation story to a class story. Um, and just, for instance, if you go back to the mid-1980s, so just 20 years after the Civil Rights Act, you look at the 15 most unequal metropolitan areas in the country. That is measured the distance between the top 10% and lowest 10% of earners. They're overwhelmingly in the South. And the uh, largest of those metro areas back then, that's just 40 years ago, was New Orleans. The rest of them were more mid-sized metros. You fast forward to today, and the top 15 are overwhelmingly the coastal cities, the one we're sitting in right now, uh, New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles. These, th this, this move of inequality has really kind of gone in this class direction. But when you, you look down into those metro areas, you know, I would argue still black residents of those places are still way too underrepresented in the top, top tier. Um, and so there is this, this uh, acknowledgment that even as we've moved into these, this more class-based definition of, of inequality, that there still seems to be this, these, these barriers to upward mobility for, for black residents. And yet when we do these large national surveys, um, we found that black working class people in America are actually really bullish on the American dream. Um, and there's long standing, I mean, a lot of survey data, you can see that college educated progressives for a long time have believed the American dream is dead. Uh, they've been joined by college educated um, Republicans in the last five years or so. Some of those negative um, people on the American dream were actually Trump voting um, Republicans. And when you look at those surveys, what stands out are, are working class black and Hispanic voters are incredibly bullish on their prospects for upward mobility. Can you, say, can you explain what's going on here? You, you know, we have, we, we have this narrative of, of class-based inequality also being a story of race inequality. And yet, when we just ask people themselves about their future, they're telling a very different story. It's like the, it's like the Monty Python Holy Grail scene, the bring out your dead scene when the guy comes out and, <laughs> and is, he says, I'm not dead yet, and they say, yes, you are. And he says, no, I'm not, and they say, yes, you are. It's like we're telling people the American dream is dead, and yet they're telling us it's not. Um, why is that? What's going on? Well, I, I think one of the problems you're, you're describing is the disconnect between what you get out of a lot of the black leadership versus what rank and file blacks tell you. And it's, it's evidence that the people you see on cable news and uh, and so forth aren't really speaking for uh, the people they claim to, to speak on behalf of. Uh, whether we're talking about the, um, the uh, American dream being dead for black people or uh, black people not wanting more police in their neighborhoods because they think police are a bigger problem than the criminals or um, black people not wanting uh, school choice or you, you name it, voter ID laws. There's this large disconnect and it's been growing between um, uh, the black elites and rank and file blacks, and I think that's what uh, that's what you see on display there, um, and that's why you're getting a, a different answer from from everyday blacks than you are from black spokesmen, so to speak. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't remember who it was who said um, that um, a little education is a dangerous thing, but that's <laughs> that, you, you know you, you mentioning Monty Python. I was just thinking that you know in terms of what 
some um, halls of higher academia uh, sort of promulgate uh, in terms of uh, uh, causing people to believe that the American dream is is uh, is corrupted and so forth. I'm, I just have this image of them just yelling, "No shame, shame, shame!" on 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 them. Uh, I, I think you know one of um, one of the fellows one of the one of the fellows here at AEI, uh, Roy Teixeira, has talked about the, uh, the, um, over the last couple of election cycles. You're starting to see um, a movement um, of um, uh, non-white voters becoming somewhat more um, conservative on on a, on, a, on a variety of issues, um, uh, voting. Um, voting, voting Republican. That that includes that, um, that includes that includes black men. Um, that, inc that includes Hispanics. It's, 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 it's also um, it's also including including uh, it's including Asians as well. So in the in the political calculus, uh, the notion that many progressives have of a using the Sharpton you know attack on one is an attack on all kind of idea. Then this notion of, of Generically speaking, people of color being part of that progressive idea that um, um, the odds are completely stacked against um, against all of them. Um, you know, that's not quite ha that's not quite happening. And so I think what you're you're actually ultimately seeing is a a shuffling of of coalitions where you're going to start you're seeing. Um, it may very well be that um, the progressives hold on to the to the larger majority, but a still a significant a significant um, uh, minority coalition that is still believing in the American dream and believing um, in the real world view that Jason was just talking about um, is actually is is actually go is going to is going to expand. I mean the uh, I mean the reason I run schools uh, in the Bronx. You know, almost exclusively for low-income Black and Hispanic students is because I want them to know that they can do hard things. You know that their that their lives can be their own. You know that they can lead lives, uh, self-determined lives of meaning and purpose and agency, even in the face of life's inevitable barriers. And you know, since 2010, I've been running schools, and I've never had a parent. Uh, come to me and say, oh, please, Mr. Rowe, please ensure that the curriculum that you've designed you know, convinces our students of all of the oppression that they're going to face and how, and how insurmountable it is and you know, how terrible the country is and that all these systems are rigged against them. They want to know what the strategies are for success. You know? And not that they have to be you know, LeBron James, but that there's, there's a pathway through knowledge and moral virtue uh, an agency that is within their child's grasp. And so I 100% agree, this disconnect between the message I shared earlier that Sharpton is saying, and again, it's not, what, what they're, what they're uh, deviously doing and now, it's not just victimhood within the black community, they're creating this larger garment of victimhood. Um, that's the narrative here, but for people who are just genuinely seeking opportunity in the hopes of the American dream. That's where the disconnect comes from, which is why I always believe that this message will resonate if the message is actually brought to the very people um, who are seeking these kinds of outcomes for their lives. Great, thanks. We'll be opening it up for questions here um, in a few minutes, so just be thinking about questions that you do have, uh, and I'll turn to you in a moment. But uh, before I do that, I just wanted to ask this question um, to close out this part of the discussion, and that is when we, when you look at the, the I Have a Dream speech, and, and Taylor Branch walked us through the extemporaneous kind of nature of that, the riff that, that it was, and you, you look at it against Dr. King's other speeches, and I think, I'm thinking of the letter from Birmingham Jail in particular, and, and what really stands out um, is this ability that he had to weave together uh, arguments rooted in natural law, um, the understanding of unalienable rights is something that anyone with reason and a sense of history and knowledge just couldn't, couldn't deny. Um, and then speaking through the prophetic language of scriptural truth and, and reality, and really just encapsulates what Robert Bella wrote back at the same time as America's civil religion, this, uh, 
this way of using um, our Judeo-Christian uh, scriptural basis for these truths that have a much more broader and universal appeal regardless of what your faith is. And this, this masterful way of being able to connect with all people. And in the letter from Birmingham Jail, the way in which he really appeals to the conscience of the white pastors that he's writing to as well, that at the, at the end of it, you just you can't disagree with him, basically. Um, do we have that, do, do leaders have that ability today? Have we, do we have enough of a shared understanding, enough of a common civil religion? <laughs> Dr. Rivers is gonna have no, something no, to say about this. No, don't, don't, let those guys go. Okay, all right, okay, all right, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Um, is that still possible? Get, well, I mean, give, well, I mean, given that um, a an increasing percentage um, of the country expresses no religion at all, um, you know, the, the the notion that um, there's a a um, a civic religion that we can uh, appeal to in a universal sense. Is is sadly um, is 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 sadly is sadly fading. Um, the uh, the uh, we've talked about Al Sharpton obviously a lot today and, and Jesse Jackson the Forum. They can they can kind of speak they can speak the words and they can still they, they can still resonate and some of those words still um, resonate um, within the context. Um, of the black community, because um, percentage-wise, you know, there are um, more more African Americans are church-going and so forth um, than than whites. But uh, in the in the in in the larger setting, I mean, I think it would it's 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 much harder um, uh, for uh, a um, let me put it this way a, a a when if a conservative is speaking in religious in religious religious terms, that individual is invariably um, attacked um, in, in terms of wanting to impose um, want, wanting to impose religion, uh, impose moral values on the uh, on the rest of, on, the, on the rest on the rest of the co country, and that, and that's portrayed often in the media in a in a in a negative in a negative way. Uh, so it's 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 much much harder. To have uh, to, to fuse that idea of natural law of the Constitution and the broader broader religious values, um, given the times that we're in right now, where the, those values have been tended to be pushed to the side. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we'll, we'll give the floor to Reverend Rivers. Can we give you the microphone, sir? Yeah. Yeah. I don't need the mic. No. Okay. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, it's being I know you don't need the giving mic. A preacher, I, I, I giving the a preacher watching mic this. is a dangerous thing. I assume the people <laughs> online can, can, uh, can hear this. Yeah, Go ahead. Look, you raised a very important question. And there is a disconnect across the class divide on the liberal side and on the conservative side. Conservative elites are in many cases as disconnected as liberal elites. Now, it's easy for conservatives to talk about liberals, because every, like, everybody likes to beat on liberals, because they're a pretty disgusting crowd. Now, 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 that said, you raise an important question because what's not generally known, there has been a discussion, there has been a discussion for the last 30 years between black Pentecostals and Catholics around natural law. There, is a, an engage, there has been an engaged, Robbie George, his crew at Princeton, uh, the folk at uh, Notre Dame, gentlemen, there is an entire universe that exists that elite intellectuals need to engage because there's the temptation to speak from the sky. For example, Charles Blake, Bishop Charles Blake, conservative, totally engaged philosophically with Catholic social teaching. No one knows that, right? Mm -hmm. Black Pentecostal guy, Church of God in Christ, the blackest denomination in the universe, engaging in a philosophical discussion that apparently is being missed by our elite intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. And so to your question, when you talk about the decline in the religion thing, um, the black Pentecostals, uh, the Wall Street Journal just did a, a, a major story on on a Saturday, 
about the explosion of global Pentecostalism. And they did a massive thing on, and gentlemen, I recommend for your consideration, there is a massive group, and much of what you said is taken for granted. Bishop Blake, no blink. In fact, they're probably the strongest on this whole transgender thing. Those folks are ready to fight philosophically because for them, uh, how should we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No blink. So gentlemen, there needs to be a new dialogue because philosophically, there is this growing movement uh, that people don't know exists that's out here. And it's growing. Great. Thanks for that. And that's, uh, th thank you, Reverend Rivers. And that is a segue into uh, this time for discussion. And let's see a number of hands in the air here. So I'm just going to start and move my way over, over here uh, on the, my right side of the room. Hi. Um, my name is Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, and I am a Democrat. <laughs> um, so, so I just want, I, you probably didn't go to the inauguration of our governor, uh, Wes Moore, in Maryland, uh, where there were prayers up the kazoo. There were prayers from Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, at his, when he was governor, for the lieutenant governor, and for the comptroller. So just, if you ever want to come to Maryland, you will hear plenty of prayers all the time. And that was true in my administration, and it's true in his administration. And the problem, reason you probably didn't hear the prayers is you didn't come to the inauguration. Um, and there are prayers, I have to tell you, when I was lieutenant governor, every event that we started, we started with a prayer. So just so you know, come to Maryland. <laughs> Second of all, um, as to the issue of crime, uh, we uh, focused on the highest crime areas in our state, 66 high crime areas, we call them hot spots, and we said we're going to reduce crime in those hot spot communities, and we reduced crime by 33% in three years by focusing on high crime areas. So there is an effort among Democrats to focus on high crime areas. I think that's important to know. I also, as Lieutenant Governor, started character education in every one of our schools so all the kids would know courage, respect, and responsibility, and use those words, because I was tired of hearing just, don't do sex, don't do drugs, don't do this and that, because I wanted strong words. And in Maryland, every kid does community service, because I made sure that every kid would learn that they could make a difference, that they had the power to make a difference. So we made, as a condition of high school graduation, service learning, and so every child does community service. So I just want you to know that as a Democrat, we teach values, we teach them they can make a difference, we teach them that they are great, they can be courageous, and we pray. So don't <laughs> knock Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that so much. Let's bring the mic up here uh, to Bob Woodson up front, and then I'll get your questions there in the back. Hi, I'm Bob Woodson, Woodson Center. Um, I just, uh, first of all, I think we need to describe, describe it as structural incompetence and structural corruption is the biggest barrier that we face mm -hmm. on the part of people who are supposed to be providing leadership in those institutions. But I would like uh, for Robert George and Ian to unpack this uh, whole issue of the success sequence. I think as conservatives, it's important for us not to define it as the only train that's leaving. I'm a single parent household too. Yeah. Dad died when I was nine. Even my mother with a fifth grade education and five kids to raise. The question is, what are the studies that looks into those households where people are successful? So why don't we begin to study? Conservatives spend a lot of time talking about the pathology of the poor and then articulating what are barriers or, or it, perverse incentives 
food, you know, testing for food stamps, uh, drug testing, and all of the things. We we're, we're really good about talking about about prohibitions and sanctions, but we don't talk about resilience and perseverance among the poor. And that's what I, I would wish you all, that when you're talking about the success, what about people who fail the success sequence? Does it mean life is over for them? Yep. And if not, then tell me what is the path towards success for people who fail the success sequence? As conservatives, we need to spend as much time on that as we do just saying, oh, if you don't pass the success sequence, you're finished. And that's the impression that's given. Uh, so, so for those of you who may not be familiar with what the success sequence is, that's data uh, that's been replicated in a few different places, Brookings and others, that if a young person finishes at least their high school degree, then, get a full, then gets a full-time job of any kind, just so they learn the dignity and discipline of work, and then if they have children, marriage first, 97% of millennials uh, avoid poverty, and the vast majority um, um, enter the middle class or beyond. And uh, as a school leader, that became a piece of content, especially in the, the neighborhoods in which I run schools where the non-marital birth rate is about 84%. Uh, that became content that we thought was important to start teaching to our kids uh, in a class called Pathways to Power, um, where we teach this content to the, to the way that um, Bob is describing, that we don't teach it as a... Um, in a prescriptive manner, we teach in what we call a descriptive manner, meaning that you as a young person are going to be making a series of choices over the next 10 years of your life around your education, work, relationships, and that there, there are different probabilities. There are different likely rewards or consequences based on different series of decisions. No single decision is fatal that um, will end your life forever. But you should know that there are certain decisions in this order where data says 97% of probability of a likelihood of avoidance of poverty. Here are another set of decisions in another order which yield different outcomes. So our approach to that is to um, ensure young people understand the full bevy of choices that they're going to be making in their own life if we really want to develop a sense of personal agency and responsibility we have to give young people this information, then, then empower them to make decisions. The one thing I'll say is, um, is that even in my own work of running schools with the success sequence, I ultimately came to the conclusion that the success sequence is almost a, it's a technical intervention. It ignores the moral dimension, right? It ignores this idea, well, how is it that a young person who's not in a community where you've got lots of married two-parent households, how is it that they are going to organically just know that that is um, the way that they should be operating? And it's why you know, I've created a, a, a larger framework, which is around the anchors of family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. So we talk to our students a lot about the power of a personal faith commitment uh, as something that I think we don't talk about enough to young people in particular, because that's the ways in which more and more young people can actually learn uh, moral right and wrong. Um, so that is a dimension that I've added to uh, teaching about the success sequence. Because I think uh, it's too easy just to say, well, just go do that. And if you don't do it, you're a failure. That's wrong. That's wrong. Um, but young people need to know that there, there are, there are, there is a script like I talk about, I talk about with my own parents. Doesn't mean it's a guarantee of success nor not following it as a guarantee of failure. But young people do need to know that there are certain sets of decisions, particularly around family, religion, and education, that are much more likely to lead you to a successful life. And I think we deprive young people, especially when we have narratives of structural this and structural that, that robs young people of the sense that they can overcome these barriers. So that's what I'd say. Yes. When it comes to us sometimes as being judgmental with our family. Got it. All I'm saying is yep. it's never too late. We must, we must study and provide evidence yep. that there is another path to yep. flourishing. Yeah, and, uh, and your, 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 data is, is, your data is dead on, and, and the type of work you're doing is dead on. But uh, again, 
um, I'll just kind of use the, the, the life experience example um, of a, a single mother. Uh, obviously, she made, in the context of some of the messages that, that come from society, she made the error of you know, having a child um, out of wedlock. But um, she works, you know, worked as a nurse, uh, you know, double shifts, all that kind of stuff. M then makes a decision, makes a decision that uh, um, uh, a Catholic, a Catholic education is a is a better option for her son. So it, this is the thing: you, you can make a, an error over here, and then and and it may have certain impact on your life, but. There are um, multiple other forks in the road where you can still make the correct de uh, the correct de decision, whether it has to do with work, whether it has to do um, with another educational choice. There are many single mothers out there who, not, not after you know, doing what they have to do to get their kids in school, then go back and then get get you know get a get a degree a degree of their own. So there. There are multiple for forks in the road. You, we can always take the, the big picture and, sit and say, you know, th these kind of things are going to have the greatest impact to keep you. But if, if there's been a mistake made, there are multiple, uh, there are corrections that can, and you're right, that message de definitely has to be um, said a lot more. It's worth pointing out too, just the host of studies that just show that importance of those values reinforcing relationships and networks, right? That, you know, schools and colleges. Um, neighborhoods, moving in and around people that are preparing for the future, doing the kinds of things you do to save for college, take the test, play sports, all that stuff, houses of worship, um, that, you know, Raj Chetty and his colleagues have been the most cited in that recently, but that, that there's a lot of studies that kind of reinforce that point over and again. So the, na the nature of the village, the nature of the community really matters. I need to go to the back here because, sir, you've had your hand up the whole time and I uh, haven't called on you yet. Go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Yaya Fanusi. I came to the United States in 1967, been here 56 years. When I have discussion since 1968, 69, this is what I always pose to African Americans. What will happen if racism ceases to exist in America? What will you do? And most of the things you've been talking about is the basic thing. You've got to go to the family, and make the home a learning environment. And they will stop talking this rubbish about racism. <laughs> I, I interviewed right. Shelby Steele last year, and uh, he, he made the comment that the, the challenge facing the black community today is not racism, it's handling freedom. That was a powerful statement. OK, I'm going to go to Megan McArdle in the back with her hand up. And we might be out of time after this, so I apologize in advance if I didn't get to your question. But we will be around afterwards. Go uh, ahead. Hi. Megan McArdle from The Washington Post. Um, I believe wholeheartedly in the success, success sequence, the importance of family structure. I believe that those are, things are also true for whites. Um, but the problem with that, I think, for a lot of people is that it feels like saying, well, um, good luck and figure it out. And so I guess the two questions I would have, um, one, because the government doesn't know how to promote marriage. It's bad at it. We've tried. <laughs> um, what sorts of things, what sorts of policy recommendations cash out of that, I'm going to say, aside from charter schools? Because, <laughs> um, And second of all, um, what if, if there aren't policy recommendations, what can people do who are not themselves forming black families or, or the rest of it, because I think that's the question that is is really eating at a lot of people. It's not that these things aren't true. It's that it leaves us feeling helpless to address what is cl clearly still a big problem for America as well as for black Americans. Um, Jason? I, I, don't, I don't think it's a question of what the government or policymakers need to start doing. It's what they need to stop doing. Um, you know, Stop please, pricing. Please stop helping us, as somebody might say. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, stop pricing young workers out of the labor force by raising the minimum wage law. Stop keeping kids trapped in failing schools. Uh, stop with the occupational licensing requirements that keep budding black entrepreneurs from starting a business. Um, stop expanding the welfare state, which, which 
subsidizes counterproductive, dangerous behavior, ultimately. I mean, a, a lot of the black poor is simply responding to incentives that anyone would respond to. Why should I go look for a job when I know I will never be able to make as much money as I'm getting from the government every month? If uh, I have fathered a child with a woman and the government catches me uh, living with that woman, she's going to lose her government support. I'm not doing her or my child any favors uh, by jeopardizing that. So it's really what the government needs to stop doing, I think, more so than, 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 than what they need to stop doing. And also, you know, this idea that there is a government solution, um, I think, is undermined by what was going on in black communities um, when, when King was giving that speech. It, between 1940 and 1960, the black poverty rate in this country fell by 40 percentage points. That's before the speech, before the Civil Rights Act, before the Voting Rights Act, before the, 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 the Great Society programs. We talk about the legacy of slavery, the legacy of, of, of Jim Crow. What about the legacy of the, of the welfare state and the Great Society, which I think is much more responsible for these problems we have today than, 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 than racism, per se? I am sorry, I'm going to have to cut this off. We're not going to be able to take all of your questions, uh, but we will be around here for the next few minutes as we set up for the next panel, and I hope you'll join me now in uh, thanking our panelists for this great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.
Şöyle yap. Well, welcome everybody. My name is John Harwood. Uh, I'm a journalist, and I'm going to be moderating this panel with uh, Robert Doerr, who you know, who uh, is the um, chief executive of the American Enterprise Institute, Fred Logeval, who's a historian at Harvard University, who's uh, written a, uh, an acclaimed book about John F. Kennedy, and Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, uh, who is a politician in her own right, uh, whose father, Robert F. Kennedy, was the uh, attorney general when the March on Washington occurred. I, I want to start by situating this discussion in a, in a bit of a personal way. Um, because we have some personal connections among us. Um, and I want to start in the summer of 1963, before the march, in, in June in particular. In June of 1963, Kathleen was 11 years old. Uh, her uncle was the president. Her father was the attorney general. She was growing up in McLean, Virginia, a wonderful house called Hickory Hill. Um, I was growing up in Chevy Chase, Maryland, a neighborhood called Somerset. My father was a journalist, was covering uh, the Kennedy administration and the Justice Department. Um, I was six years old uh, that summer. Uh, and Robert was growing up across the street and a few houses down from us in Somerset um, with his brother Burke, who's uh, in the audience. And your uh, with my mother, B. Harwood, uh, who is right there, 94 years old, still going strong, is right here in the audience. Um, Burke was just born in May. He was named after uh, his father's um, uh, immediate uh, superior uh, at the Justice Department, Burke Marshall. Um, his sister, Gail, was my sister Helen's good friend. And in my class at Stone Ridge. At Stone Ridge. And we used to uh, have a lot of good times uh, uh, bouncing on the trampoline in, in the backyard of, of Robert's house. But more importantly, his father uh, did some of the most important work of the civil rights movement from a federal government perspective. Um, he was given the Medal of Freedom by President Obama for this in uh, the year 2012. And I want to uh, start with a little vignette that shows uh, in, I think, a profound way, uh, the kind of work that he did. He was the face of the Justice Department in the South uh, during that period. And at every uh, signal moment uh, of the uh, early civil rights movement there, he was present. And by the way, he was not put in that job by John F. Kennedy. He was a Republican. He started work in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department during the Eisenhower administration and stayed on and is somebody who didn't shrink from the most difficult work, um, including accompanying James Meredith to uh, register for classes to become the first uh, uh, black American student at the University of Mississippi. There was a terrible riot that night. He spent the night in James Meredith's dorm room um, and a year later, uh, there was an event that became burned in everyone's consciousness. Uh, it was uh, June the 15th. It was after the assassination of Medgar Evers uh, in uh, Mississippi. And Evers' funeral took place in Jackson. And there was a lot of concern that that was going to result in more violence because there were marchers who wanted to protest beyond the funeral. Uh, and there were uh, a set of racist police officers who were eager to bust some heads. And in the breach, standing in between those two, those two sets of people was John Doerr. And I want to read a little vignette from a book called The Race Beat. And it was about uh, press coverage of the civil rights movement. And it talked about that incredibly tense moment. Uh, some of the younger marchers began hurling bottles, bricks, and other items at the uniformed officers. Uh, there's a re uh, reflection by Bill Miner, who was a columnist for a uh, paper in Mississippi. And he was terrified about what was about to happen to Jackson. And he said, uh, 
in the chaos and the oppressive heat, a lanky white man in a white shirt and a thin tie loosened at the collar walked down the middle of Ferris Street ur urging calm. He was John Doerr, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. He turned to the cops and he said, cool it. He turned to the protesters and said, you're not going to solve anything with bricks and bottles. And Bill Miner, the columnist for uh, the newspaper in Mississippi, uh, said, oh, the, the statement that he kept repeating with everyone's eyes on him, my name is John Doar, D-O-A-R. I'm from the Justice Department, and anyone around here knows that I stand for what's right. Uh, Bill Miner, the uh, columnist for the Jackson paper, said he could not believe the courage that he was witnessing. And when it was over, he said that John Doar had answered his prayer and saved the city of Jackson. And I want to pull up the picture of John Doar at that moment. He's standing in between the cops and the protesters. And that, I think, was uh, mm. just a remarkable moment of the civil rights movement. So I, I'd like to start. Robert, you were only two years old at the time. Um, so I don't expect that you have many memories about it. But I'd be interested <laughs> in your reflections of uh, juxtaposed well, against what you've learned over the yeah, years. So first of all, I'm a little embarrassed by all that because uh, dad's heroes, the heroes that he talked about it, in our household, when I was very young, were the uh, black civil rights workers at the grassroots level who were risking their lives uh, and lost some of them their lives uh, to get equal rights in the United States. So Bob Moses or Herbert Lee or Dr. King or Louis, uh, Louis Allen, these were people who uh, he really admired most. Francis Joseph Atlas was the first sharecropper that he went to work for. Um, so they were the ones, and he also knew, and he'd always would point out that he knew the, he knew he knew some of the police officers behind him, and he knew a lot of the protesters in front of him. So he was actually calling out to them as, as as people he knew, and asking them to help him, uh, quiet that day. And so um, it's nice of you to open this this way. I I didn't expect you to do that. Or I didn't ask you to do that. But it, and Dad was very brave. But there were a lot of people that were a lot braver than him. And I think he thought uh, later in life that he had let some of those people that lost their lives down. And he hadn't, that this, this challenge that they had in the South during that time was complicated and hard and difficult and dangerous. And the people they were up against were ferociously violent. And uh, that I think he thought later that he wished he had actually been able to do more. And, and that there were a lot of things that didn't go quite right. And so, um, that's how he looked at it, and that's how my family looked at it. And I would just point out one other item. It's true that um, uh, he uh, started in the Eisenhower administration and is a Republican, but he was in that job because Robert Kennedy wanted him to be in that job. And that wouldn't have been possible unless Robert Kennedy had seen something in him that was worth keeping. And Dad used to say that the chain of command of the Justice Department was short and straight. John Doerr to Burke Marshall to Robert Kennedy to the President of the United States. And uh, he had great respect and admiration for the people that brought him to the Eisenhower administration for sure, but he really thought that the energy level of the Justice Department and the intensity of their efforts and the support that he got from the, from the Attorney General and the President was phenomenal. And uh, so, uh, you know, and after that, you know, he went back to his hotel and sort of the way that the the Kennedys operate, you know, they said, call the White House, the president wants to talk to you. And John Kennedy came in line. It's the president of the United States calling him. He wasn't assistant attorney general. He was the deputy to the assistant attorney general, saying, good job, John. And in old, in old Miss, uh, you know, you talk about Drummond Avenue. My mother was on Drummond Avenue, and Robert Kennedy called her during the night to tell her that when Meredith, Meredith was OK and John's OK. He also has called Dad and said, hey, John, you're a long way from Wisconsin, uh, which is where Dad was from. So yeah, it was, it was an exciting and special time in our country's history. My father played a role in it. But there were a lot of players, a lot of courageous people uh, that really did amazing things. And, and it wasn't all perfect, and it didn't always come out quite right. Uh, it was complicated. I recommend to everyone an oral history uh, recorded on video 
about a half an hour of John Doerr talking about that time. And you know, he was asked the question, are you a hero? And he said, no. He said, we wanted to make sure we did our best. So I want, but I want to switch. Uh, Robert mentioned the, the call from, from Robert Kennedy to Kathleen. You may have some better memories of that. You were 11 years old. And a few days before that event, on June the 10th, it was as uh, uh, George Wallace was uh, integrating or, or was standing in the schoolhouse door to prevent the integration of the University of Alabama, which was uh, a sequence that led to um, uh, a speech that President Kennedy gave, a nationally televised speech. Um, but I, I came across this in a, in a biography of um, Kathleen's father. It said, um, on June 10th, the day before a pair of black students were scheduled to illustrate the University of Alabama, Kennedy had permitted a documentary film crew to record his family breakfast at Hickory Hill and follow him to work. Cameras showed him cheerfully tousling heads and telling his children to finish their milk. Do you remember that? Yes, but just on this, um, I want James Meredith said about your father, he was one of the bravest people in American history. So I, I just want you to know that because we're so lucky that we have Robert head of AEI, and that we really are, and that he's put on this meeting today, and I want to thank him for doing that. I think that's very important, and it's important to remember our history, and it's, it's I've got a famous father, you know, <laughs> and and you've got a wonderful father who was really courageous because he really did. We'll hear about it maybe more in the next half hour, 45 minutes. But John Doerr was there with James Meredith, was there in Jackson, and was there all the time in the most dangerous places working with people who weren't accustomed to working with the Department of Justice, talking with people, getting the FBI to do the right thing, which was really, really difficult. And I hope we'll get into that at one point. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so and you didn't point out that Robert ran my 86 campaign. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I did not know that. Yeah, well, that's a little detail we don't yeah. advertise a lot. He doesn't yeah, want to yeah. boast. <laughs> <laughs> there, um, there are some secrets he wants to keep. Yeah. I'm also. <laughs> Never mind. Let's get Do, back to the let's go. Department. Let's go back okay. to this let's breakfast so with this the documentary the film crew. So, Do you remember um, that? Yes, yes. So Daddy allowed the uh, documentary film crew to come into our house. There are a lot of pictures of, of, of our house. And then he allowed them to come to the Justice Department. And what is interesting about, and I have to give um, a credit to my sister, Carrie. So you can see Daddy with about five children in his arms when he's talking to Robert Doerr and Nick Katzenbach and trying to integrate uh, the University of Alabama. Now, it's very popular today to have children come to work, right? It was not really popular in 1963. Nobody had take your children to work day. And no, you didn't do it usually with your father. When he's on the call with the police with the National Guard, and you're trying to get people to do the integration. And yet, because he has children on his lap, he has an understanding that you are dealing with human beings, and also it's difficult to keep your humanity when you're also talking about how to make people do the right thing. And I think it's critically interesting to think about when sometimes when people make tough decisions, it's just, I'm going to be very tough and not understand that they're human beings that you're talking about. But if you have a child on your lap and other children running up and down your office. You may not understand. Daddy, most attorney generals used a side room for their office, which was like 10 feet by 12 feet. 
My father used a room that was about this size because he liked to toss a football in the room. It was a really large room. And the children, my brothers and sisters, just ran up and down while he's on the phone. And I think it makes for an interesting way of dealing with your work because you're not just dealing with your head, you're also dealing with your heart and with your guts about how you're going to deal, how you're going to work out the issue of integrating the University of Alabama, and you're also going to remain true to your children. And, and by the way, just speaking of that, uh, the ABC News recorded three Kennedy kids running around the office, uh, and uh, RFK interrupted the discussion with his And put aides Kerry on the phone. And put Kerry on the phone with Nick Katzenbach, who was the uh, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, and Katzenbach told Kerry, tell your father it's 98 degrees down here. We're all going to need hardship pay. Um, all right, I want to pull the lens back uh, and uh, go to Fred. Obviously, this is the John F. Kennedy's administration. John F. Kennedy's political career began after World War II when he was elected to Congress. And it wasn't always a straight path. Uh, he was someone who um, had the impulse to do the right thing, as, as Kathleen put it, but also was balancing that against uh, political pragmatism. Talk a little bit about that with John Kennedy. Yeah, uh, it's it's exactly the the, the case. Um, I think I think he was a person largely free of personal prejudice. I write a little bit about this in volume one of the biography. I'm going to flesh this point out in the second the second volume. There's lots of evidence, John, that he tended to treat people the same. JFK did, regardless of their station in life, regardless of skin color, and so forth. So there's that. And that's evident early on. As he's running for Congress, it's early, it's evident in the House and in the Senate. But we have to balance that against what I guess I would call an intermittent attention to racial injustice. Um, and so the daily plight of African Americans was not something that typically moved him. And so it's those two things that are in some way in tension with one another. What you see, I think, is a, 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 maybe to some people, surprisingly progressive voting record in the House and in the Senate by John F. Kennedy on the issue of civil rights. I was surprised when I started my research at that fact. It's there in the, in the record. Um, but as I think you're suggesting, John, he's a political pragmatist. And so he plays footsie with Southern segregationists in 1960. I'm now at the story in volume two in which I'm getting him elected. So I've just spent a lot of time in, in 1960. And it's clear that on this issue in particular, uh, this pragmatism ultimately wins out. He believes that he needs Southern support. First, to claim the nomination as a Catholic and as somebody who's deemed to be too young by, young by most people, inexperienced, uh, and then to win against Nixon in the fall campaign. But Fred, let me go back even further than 1960. You recount an episode in the book, in, in your first volume, uh, in 1956, when John F. Kennedy decided to go, and the people around him decided to uh, go for the vice presidency and yeah. get him nominated. Yeah. And as part of that effort, of course, the Democratic coalition at that point was uh, extremely dependent on uh, white Southern segregationists, the Solid South. He was asked during that uh, attempt to get the vice presidency if he would publicly affirm the rightness of the Brown v. Board uh, Supreme Court decision uh, outlawing legal segregation in schools, and he wouldn't do it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's quite true. Segregationists controlled, as I think you all know, the key committees in Congress. They were hugely important in the Democratic Party. And it was a, it was a brief, it was a, a very dramatic moment when this race for the vice presidency occurred. Because Adlai Stevenson, as I think you know, decided to throw the, the, the nomination uh, to the floor of the convention. And the Kennedys were not really prepared for this. Nobody was prepared for this. And I think, as John points out, he faced that moment and he wouldn't affirm it. Um, even then, both, both before that, from 47 
uh, up to 56, and then in 57, 58, and 59, on legislative votes, as I said earlier, he's actually, it seems to me, progressive. But he's being really cautious, really careful. You know, there's a, there's a, a quote by the writer John Egerton that I often use, which I think speaks powerfully to Kennedy's position, and maybe the position of many others at that point. Egerton said as follows, segregation didn't restrict me in any way. And therefore, it was easy for me to go about my business, take my freedom for granted, and not think too much about anybody else. It seems to me a very powerful statement by Egerton, made much later, more or less Kennedy's contemporary. And I think it's also, in a sense, summarizing John F. Kennedy's own position in this period. Um, go ahead, I just Robert. say that, that I think um, there was a lot of growth going on. And there's been a lot of writing about growth in the Kennedy uh, view of the world. But what Burke Marshall would say was that the more they were exposed to the bravery and dignity of the civil rights movement workers, the freedom riders, and the people that, that marched in the streets in Birmingham, and saw the absolute violence and hatred of the organized uh, racist uh, South, um, and saw people get their heads crashed in, in t completely defenseless circumstances, walking off a bus with no police officers anywhere around, and being attacked by a mob of 50 men. Um, they, their sense of injustice and their humanity yeah woke up, and as Burke Marshall used to say, the more they saw, the angrier they got. No question. I, I, I think that's true, although I, it is interesting that when Daddy was at the U University of Virginia, he did ask Ralph Bunch to come and speak, and it was, there was a fight, because um, there, was a law, there was a law and a rule at the University of Virginia, all across Virginia, there, there could be no integrated audiences. And Daddy fought to have it integrated. And it was the first time ever in the state of Virginia that there was an integrated audience at, the, at UVA. And Ralph Bunch, there was no hotel that would take him in. So he spent the night at my parents' house. And all night long, um, my parents' house was pelted by bananas and apples and rocks um, because so, so many people were angry that my parents mm. took him in and that he was uh, there to hit. So uh, my father had some sense that people didn't like African Americans or blacks, but didn't understand it to the great extent yeah. that he clearly started to understand it. But as soon as he got to the Justice yeah. Department, the, in the first week, he walked through the Justice Department and said, where are the black lawyers? And said immediately, we've got to hire more black lawyers. So. He understood it intellectually, yeah. I think, yeah. um, but not viscerally and in his gut. And that took some time, as Robert said. In, in May, just very quickly, in May of 1960, and I think this would apply to both brothers, but in May of 1960, just as the, the campaign, uh, the, the Democratic National Con Convention will meet in a couple months, they're starting to think about the fall race, they're feeling confident about the nomination. Robert Kennedy said to Harris Wofford, civil rights official uh, with the campaign, he said, uh, you know, I haven't known too many black people in my life. Tell us, t tell me about this issue. Tell me what we need to do. It speaks to, to the kind of upbringing that they had. And this is certainly true of, of JFK, but I think it's also true of Robert. But again, this capacity that all three of you are talking about for, for understanding and for growth. What, the, other, the other thing, they're political. You know, they, they had to win. They wanted to win. They Absolutely. Needed, yeah. They needed the South. And yeah. I think Robert Kennedy said when he went to speak in Georgia that the state of Georgia gave the president the largest percentage victory of any state in the Union in terms of the margin. And so they were always operating in a world in which they had to navigate a political circumstance. Well, and speaking really of that... Did, which was not so easy uh, to just sort of... Uh, reach all the way for the end game before you lay the groundwork. Speaking of that, speaking of 1960, in Georgia in particular, there was a landmark incident in that campaign when Martin Luther King had been uh, jailed for a minor offense and sentenced by a judge to hard labor uh, 
for a certain period of time. And it was an outrageous sentence. And the uh, Kennedy campaign had to figure out what to do about it. And there was John F. Kennedy, the candidate, and Robert, who was his um, top political advisor. And as it happened, um, uh, John F. Kennedy called Martin Luther King, or, uh, sorry, ca called Coretta Scott King, and Robert called the judge, uh, and eventually... <laughs> Which turned out to be more effective. <laughs> uh, eventually, the, um, uh, Ro uh, Martin Luther King was uh, released. But Fred, talk a little bit about what went into that decision. Well, I think here it's worth uh, giving a shout out, I think, to, to maybe two people in particular. One is Harris Wofford, who I mentioned before. The other is Sergeant Shriver. Um, and there were others in the campaign who basically said, we need to show uh, what we're about in this case. And I think to, to Robert's point, it was also they thought the smart thing politically to do. This is a voting, th this is something that actually could help swing this election. Um, and, uh, it did. and it did. And John F. Kennedy did pick up the phone, called Mrs. King. Robert Kennedy was initially skeptical, shall we say, of that decision. But, Curious. But, but decided uh, for his, because the two brothers were ultimately on the same page, that he was going to make his own effort, and it worked. And arguably, of course, when an, when an election is as close as the 1960 election was, any one of 12 things could be called decisive. But one of those 12 could certainly be this decision that the two of them made against the advice of other people in the campaign, strong encouragement from, from, from Shriver and from Wofford, that that tipped the balance on this razor thin, much thinner than they imagined it would be, election uh, to come. Well, I don't and one of my favorite quotes from that is that um, you know, Martin Luther King said, I'm not going to endorse. Yeah. But, fa but his father his said, father. I'll vote for <laughs> a Catholic or the devil himself. So clearly, Father King didn't even like Catholics. That's how deep the anti-Catholic sentiment was. <laughs> um, I've got a church full of votes for a, Senator a suitcase Kennedy. suitcase full of votes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I just th it's yeah. very interesting about yeah. the anti-Catholicism. I don't want to tell two historians against you. Taylor tells this episode very well in Parting the Waters. And Lewis Martin yes. was another black member of the, uh, the campaign staff who yeah. was very influential in this. Yeah. They didn't know, Robert and John Kennedy didn't know how effective it was going to turn out politically till after they did it and after it paid off. Yeah. And they did it very stealthily. Once they had made these calls and uh, uh, Reverend King Sr. had announced his endorsement, they went through the black press and the black churches. And they told the story there, but they didn't, tell, they didn't advertise it in Alabama or they, they, Mississippi. They made a leaflet uh, that was distributed in, uh, among black voters that said, uh, uh, JFK called, Nixon did not. And just yeah. one last thing, I don't think any campaign aide would have dared to advise Robert Kennedy to call the judge because they were afraid of how he would react negatively to that. He went off and did that on his own, Well, now, I think. Uh, historians may disagree on that because Evan Thomas, in his uh, biography of um, RFK, said that, in fact, he was doing that at the direction of his brother. And it recounts uh, a story that came out much later uh, that was... John F. Kennedy had called the governor of Georgia, That's right. who was a segregationist, who said, I want you to win, but I don't want to be embarrassed myself. It would harm me politically. So let's do this quietly. Why don't you uh, uh, put, get a call put into the judge? Yeah, yeah. And that's what uh, that's uh, Kathleen's father did. Yeah. Well, let's take it forward then to once the administration took office. Um, Fred, describe their, uh, the administration's relationship, a mix of caution and idealism toward the civil rights movement. Well, this pragmatism that we're talking about, I think, continues to very much rule the, rule the, the game, if you will. Uh, and I think, and I'll speak primarily here of the president, uh, I think he tended to react to violent incidents. And it took that often for him to respond in a forceful manner and to direct his brother to do the same. 
And so there is a, a kind of evolution. And if you look at Martin Luther King's views, and, and Taylor Branch, of course, has written so powerfully about this, in 60 and even in 61, I think he was under the impression that John F. Kennedy didn't really get it, didn't really understand uh, the stakes and what was necessary here. But over time, as we get into 62 and certainly into 63, King's view begins to change. And he called, in, in the early part of 1963, he is now referring to what he calls a new Kennedy, a new JFK. So he saw that that happened, but I think, I think John, before that, it is pragmatism. There's a sense on the part of JFK that if I want to have legislation passed domestically, and if I, if I want support for my Cold War policies, always the more, most important thing to John F. Kennedy in this period is how to respond internationally, I've got to have Southern segregation who are, who are controlling key committees. I've got to have them on my side. So as Robert pointed out, extremely polit political all the way through. The, um, uh, it's fascinating to me the way that the Cold War was threaded oh. throughout uh, this period. You talk in your book about when he was a congressman and he was advocating um, uh, various civil rights measures. He was saying, if we don't do this, we will give uh, fodder to the Soviet Union yeah. uh, to trash talk the United States. Yeah. On the other hand, in the early part of his administration, including in 1963, when you had violent incidents and you had a push and pull between the aggressiveness of the protesters, the violence of the resistors, and trying to tamp down both of them so it wasn't too explosive, one of the reasons he gave was the more discord, violent discord we have in the country, the more fodder that's going to give to the Soviet Union. So that was threaded through. But um, I, I want to get uh, Kathleen Yu to react to um, uh, this point. And again, this is from uh, the biography of your father. In early June, when they learned of King's plans for a mass march on Washington, the Kennedys were very anxious. It was clear the Kennedys could not stop the march, but they could try to control and co-opt it. Talk a little bit about that. That's true. I just want to remind you, because Charlene Hunter Gall told me the story about how when my father went and gave the speech in Georgia, he said the civil rights movement has to work, or something to that extent, because it's part of the uh, fight for the Cold War. And she said it made her feel so good that they were on the front lines for the Cold War. I think he, what he must have said sounded better than <laughs> the way you've described it, or at least he made it sound better than what they were afraid of. Anyway, just, just this. Um, so when they learned that uh, Martin Luther King wanted to do the March on Washington, they had a choice to fight it or to say, let's work together. And the decision was, by John Kennedy and, and my father, let's work together. And so my father put together a group at the Justice Department run by uh, John Douglas, who was um, a very good friend of uh, John oh, Doerr and my, and my mother and, and, uh, and my father to help. And they met every morning um, and every afternoon to figure out how they can help make sure that the March on Washington went well. And they must have worked very closely with Bayard Rustin, but they, they worked on making sure the speaker system was working well. Uh, they, they got Jerry Bruno, who was the best uh, advanced person in the Kennedy campaign and to, to work on it. They brought down, they brought African, uh, black um, police officers from New York, because there were no black police officers in Washington, DC. They wanted them. You heard that they made sure there was no liquor. There was no glass, so that there could be no glass. They, they, at one point, um, they were afraid that there weren't going to be enough people. Um, John Kennedy brought in labor leaders um, to make sure that there were a lot of white people involved in the march, because they wanted to make sure that it was an integrated march. Um, and there were, um, there were a number of things that they really wanted to do. They wanted a large march. They wanted it to be integrated. and. And they looked at some of the speeches by um, 
to make sure that it wasn't too radical. And that upset a number of, of the blacks. Uh, um, and Malcolm X was very angry. Uh, what he saw was a co-option of the march. He didn't like the idea that blacks and whites were playing in the, in the reflecting pond together. Um, but John Kennedy wanted the, to get the Civil Rights Bill passed. And he thought the, the more that it looked like people were for it, and there was a large crowd of blacks and whites for the Civil Rights Bill, the greater the opportunity of getting it passed. Um, I think in the one of the earlier panels, and we might have a diff, diff, different reading, and I, was that the House looked like they were, were willing to get it passed. The Senate, with the leaders of the right wing, but the, not, the conservative senators clearly didn't want it to get it passed. And as you're right, uh, Taylor, um, you really needed the Republicans. Everett Dirksen was very, very important to get that passed. But it was very important for the, um, the White House, President Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, to get as many people to that march as possible, to make it work as well as possible, to make it peaceful as well as possible. So, so Robert, the, let me ask you, yeah. if the overriding imperative was for that march to be successful, and that was a, a, uh, a paramount priority of the administration, did they succeed? Oh, I think absolutely they succeeded. I mean, it was, uh, Andrew Young says, we have the quote in the pamphlet, that after the march, it became a an American movement, not just a, a, a civil rights black movement in the South, but it, it sent a message. And I, I was checking some interesting, you know, more topical data, 250,000 people, it was a huge crowd, an amazing crowd. And I don't think that you could say that John Kennedy got them to come, he asked them to help bring them. And the labor unions and the Christian church groups yeah, and the Jewish true. groups, they came voluntarily, they came because this was something special. And then Dr. King gave a tremendous speech that put it all together and said that his dream was 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 part of the American dream. And so, yeah, I think it was successful. And the other thing that I was going to mention, you know, this most recent disaster, January 6th, there was 10,000 people here in Washington. 2,000 people went into the Capitol. Yeah. 250,000 then, and they didn't march on the Capitol. They went to the Lincoln Memorial because they didn't want it to, they wanted it to be a, a community, a gathering that didn't, that would, would be successful politically. And then they all go over to the White House, which is another amazing thing to me, But to all the leaders. Fred, if it may be true, as Robert said, that it became an American movement then, it nonetheless is true that the prospects for that civil rights bill were very much in doubt yeah. uh, when it was yeah. proposed after that. It was only after the assassination of President Kennedy yeah, right. and the tremendous political momentum that um, accrued to the uh, new president, Lyndon Johnson, that they got it passed. Yeah, no, it's true. And Kennedy's pivot on this is pretty interesting. Early on, he's very skeptical of the march, as I think we've discussed, because he thinks it'll harm the prospects for the bill. Then, after they've decided to work with the organizers and to have the march, now he wants a very large turnout. He says the worst thing for this will be if it's a small march because it'll convince Southerners in particular, well, I guess this is not a very big issue. So then he, he wants a very, very large march. But I think it's, I think some data points are interesting here. Even before the march, in July of 1963, a Harris poll, so this is after his June, 9, June 11th speech, a Harris poll says that 90% of African Americans intend to vote for John F. Kennedy for his reelection. And then after the march, the poll, actually the poll numbers go even higher as you can imagine. 89%, slightly lower, but 89% in a Gallup poll, I think in late August, approve of, of the job that the administration is doing in, in civil rights. But I think you're right, John, it still requires the efforts of, of Lyndon Johnson, heroic efforts, He's benefiting from the fact that he's following a martyred president. Uh, and, but, but nevertheless, Johnson's role in 64 is critical. But I also believe, as I'm going to argue in the second volume, the actions of John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert in 63, and others who were involved in this, including John Doerr, of course, 
paved the way for what happens in 64. And so that needs to be acknowledged in any discussion of the 1964 uh, act. K Kathleen, I want to get you to comment on um, uh, the march in context of other events. Fred talked about the um, galvanizing importance for uh, John F. Kennedy and perhaps your father of those violent incidents which became a spur to action. How would you um, uh, situate the March on Washington and its influence on the ultimate success of the movement with the uh, murder of the three civil rights movement uh, uh, workers in June of 1964, immediately preceding the passage of the, of the Civil Rights uh, Act, which occurred in uh, uh, July, and then the following year, the passage of the Voting Rights Bill after the Selma March and the violence that took place? I, um before I say that, I just wanted to point out that when John Kennedy gave the speech and, and called civil rights a moral issue, and Taylor said, you know, that they were still writing the speech before it was actually put on. That's right. Everybody in the White House was uh -huh. against John Kennedy giving that speech. Everybody, except for my father. Only my father and John Kennedy wanted him to take on civil rights. So that's just interesting in, in and of itself. And it is my father who did say, and his, he was wrong about this. He said, look, the Irish overcame discrimination. African Americans can overcome it too. And they will have a black president in 40 years, just as we did. And he was right about that. In 40 years, we did get Barack Obama. I'm not saying my father was, he happened to be right, but who knows why he was right. Um, I think the violence made a big difference. And I'm, it's a very sad, I gotta I got say, I do believe that my, father, my uncle's death helped get it through. And I, it makes me very sad that violence um, helps move people. And I don't like saying it, and I don't like it to be true, and it makes me very sad that I have to answer that question, yes. And that people respond to, to, some, to, to terror, to, they don't, and that's what, that's what people respond to. So I'm so sorry that I have to say that, and I'm sorry that you had to ask that question, and I'm so sorry that children had to die. It's just an awful, awful situation. And it made me sad to hear the, the panel before me speak about how everybody wants to be a victim, that one group of they were talking about all the progressives that want to be victims and all the people who are support Trump wants to be a victim. And I, I find it all very, very unhappy. Uh, I just, you know, I thought that John Kennedy said, ask what you can do for your country. And my father, I thought, tried to appeal to the best of us. And I thought Franklin Roosevelt asked us not to fear. And I was just, my heart is broken when I have to answer that question. I'm really sad, sad about it. And I wish we could figure out a different way to talk about ourselves and to talk about our politics and to get things done in a different way. Robert, your reflection on that question? Well, um, so one of the um, stories that my dad used to tell was that when they went over to the White House, uh, to see the president, President Kennedy, uh, and the attorney general said he could come along. And they went with Burke Marshall and his boss and the attorney general, and they go over to the White House. And, you know, for bureaucrats in Washington, this is a big deal. You're a Justice Department official, and you're going to see the president. And they went in, and, and um, Robert Kennedy said, now, now, uh, Mr. President, uh, John, John was here before us. He's one of those guys we kept around. And the president said, well, we better be careful what we say. <laughs> and, uh, and then what I was getting to was this was a strategy discussion about the Civil Rights Act. And the president looked around and, and saw all these people related to the, his team and the attorney general. And his first thing out of his mouth was, where's the vice president? We need him here. And so they went and got him. And the vice president came in. This is a story dad would tell. You historians will have to confirm this. But this is a story he would tell. And I think it's true. I know it's true. 
And the president, vice president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, was kind of a prickly guy, and he was a little mad he'd been pulled out of a meeting or something else, and had been sort of treated like an afterthought. And he came in, and he was grouchy and unpleasant and kind of uh, sullen. And, um, but the conversation got going, and the minute it turned to uh, strategy on the Hill, the vice president perked up and said, well, no, no, let me tell you how we're going to do that. And let me tell you what we have to, who we have to talk to about this. And my father used to always say that, that it was a, you know, they both worked on it together. And they, they both had qualities that made it happen. And, as, and of course, the movement was the principal driver. And, but that President Johnson's political abilities were very successful. And the last thing I'll just say is, is that when Robert Kennedy went to the signing ceremony of the Civil Rights Act, and um, Lyndon Johnson signed it, and he had you know, 20 pens, and he handed a pen and said, give this to John Doerr. Robert Kennedy put it in a nice thing and sent it to him when the inscription was, pen used to sign President Kennedy's Civil Rights Act of 1964. So um, you know, politicians compete, <laughs> and, they, and, they, and that's OK, because they're competing uh, when they're at their best to do what's right for America. We're going to go to questions in just a moment. But before we do that, I'd like to get brief thoughts from each of you on the following question. Taylor, in his remarks, talked about how uh, the March on uh, he likened it to a baptism, a beginning. Um, in the panel with Jason and Robert and Ian, they uh, emphasized a different angle, which was more that that, that was the, the fundamental work uh, of the movement was done, and now um, uh, other things need to be emphasized, including personal responsibility. How do you guys see uh, the March on Washington in terms of beginning or end point uh, uh, with respect to the current day? Who wants to go first? Why don't you go first? Oh, oh. So I, I think that's an important turning point for the country. I think it had an enormous effect on two major acts of the Congress in the future years. Um, and I think it was also a high point of a certain aspect of the civil rights movement. And we're going to talk about this at, in the next panel with Bob Woodson, of, of a certain unity, uh, even though if you read the real facts, there was no one ever was getting along with everybody about anything. But there was a certain unity and a, and a purity and an innocence to the, to the movement and to the effort. And then I think what happened in later years, but not right then, but over time in the later 60s, it began to, 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 to lose its, its glory. And so I, I am of those who believe that um, when we went from aspirations for black Americans and a recognition of their assets and their qualities of greatness, to a, a rhetoric about black Americans that does talk about them as victims persistently of racism that can never go away, that isn't consistent with the movement pre the march. And so I don't know that it was a beginning. I think it was a culmination, and it was a turning point. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't, that's how I see it. Fred? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I, I guess I would also say that it's, it's, a, it's an important turning point. Or if we look at the June 11th speech together with the march, if we put those two together and we think about the summer of 63, it's an extraordinary moment in this story. Hugely important moment, it seems to me. Not least for what it, what it uh, says about the thinking in the White House and how this issue is now going to be approached. And I think that's true of John F. Kennedy in his final five months of life. I think it's true of his vice president who will take over after that terrible day in Dallas. Um, but it's, cer it's certainly not a culmination because of everything that still needs to happen and still needs to happen today. Um, but it's, 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 there's no question in my mind that as we, tell, as we write the history of this ongoing struggle, that period and the march and the turnout for the march and Ms. Dr. King's speech, Reverend King's speech, just hugely important. Kathleen? Well, 
I think between the March and 1968, there's, there's a lot of churning. So I think that if you say it's the beginning of the end, that's how I would put it. And then the, and then the end is 1968. Because you, you get two laws that are very important passed, and then you have the burnings in the, for two, two summers. And then you have real fights over the Vietnam War. So, and then you have a split, a really important split in the, in the, um, in the movement between the Black Panthers who give up on God and Martin Luther King who believes in God. What are you saying? She's, she's saying, she said, yes. Thumbs up. Amen. Yeah. Amen. yeah. And I think that hurts. Uh, and, I've written, and I've written about this, so you're going to have to hear about it. Um, and that, I think, hurts the women's movement. And I think it hurts uh, every other progressive movement, which has been detrimental to our country. Who's got a question? You know, there's a, can, may I just say, yes. while we're on this point, there's this, there's a photograph that some of you may have seen. It was taken by a photographer of the Dallas Morning News on November 22nd, uh, early in the morning on the 22nd, uh, Ken John F. Kennedy's last day, as it turned out, in which a, a black gentleman reaches across uh, a group of people to shake the hand of John F. Kennedy, and it's, just, and I think about that image and its importance, and it just resonates for, with me. I'm going to try to have that image, if I can get permission, in the book. But it just speaks to this question. And I think the hope that I see that is expressed right there in Dallas, of all places, on that day. Questions? Yes. Joe Freeman, I introduced myself this morning, so yes. I'll skip that and go straight to my first question. If there's time later, I have a second one. Um, I read all of the decisions by the, on civil rights uh, written by the federal, Southern Federal District judges appointed by both Eisenhower and Kennedy. And it's clear that the Eisenhower judges were more likely to write pro-civil rights decisions than the Kennedy appointed judges. And indeed, two of the best were appointed, ju federal judges were appointed by Eisenhower, and two of the worst by Kennedy. Could you please comment on that, or maybe explain it? Um, so I, can I just address this, because mm -hmm. this is a, uh, so Judge Tuttle, Wisdom, Brown, and Reeves, yes. along with Justice Judge Johnson, were great uh, judges who were appointed by just Judge Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower, and they, they needed to do a lot of work, because other judges on that bench previously, or including a few that were appointed by President Kennedy, weren't so good. And so that's all true, and Jack Bass has written about it. Um, and, um, and I think that uh, um, in the, if you, if you have to look at the entire record of the Kennedy appointments, because there were some good ones in there as well, in the South, in the Fifth Circuit. Um, but, but what I think that Robert Kennedy and President Kennedy were dealing with, and the political people in the White House were dealing with, was the long tradition of deferring to the senators from those states. And the Democratic senators from those states wanted their guys, and they were all guys, appointed. And when Eisenhower was in office, the very few Republicans in the South got to pick their guys. And the Republican Party, prior to 1960, was the party of Lincoln and was the party of civil rights for blacks in the South. So Wisdom, Brown, Tuttle, and Reeves, and Johnson came from that tradition. But they ended up being allies of the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department under Robert Kennedy. And they were great allies, and President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were never afraid to give them credit for the historic decisions they made. I think we've got a question right here, too. Yes. If you could say more about your perspective on the secularization of the movement, you see the split. And one of the things that's happened in much of the narrative is that people have misunderstood and not fully appreciated how the death of a 
profound belief in God, which the movement generated, when there's the pivot with Panthers and all of the hard black nationalist stuff, that created a real crisis that the black community for many years never overcame. Could you say more about your understanding well, of that? Well, th this is my perspective. Um, so I, up until recently, you would the, the statistics are that 80% of the United States is re religious, believed in God. And so if, 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 and so when Martin Luther King talks about God, they have to, they listen, because there's they're something that, they sh that everybody shares, a Christian tradition or a, or a Judeo Christian tradition. If you give up on that, that means you're giving up on shared values. And that, I thought, I think, was, is a mistake politically. Every progressive movement in the United States until the last, till the last three, the women's movement and the LGBT movement and the Black Panther movement did not have a religious tradition. In the 19th century, the feminist tr had a women's Bible. And the, when the anti-slave movement found the, looked at the Bible and said, oh yes, there may be slaves, which is what the Southern Baptists said. And they said, but Christ believed in freedom. So they used the same Bible, and they found freedom in the Bible. So they used, so they took religion and rewrote it. By giving up on religion, they seceded. They ceded? Is yeah, that ceded. not seceded? Seceded. I love it when I get the right word. <laughs> <laughs> they ceded a huge tradition with which to talk to half the country, which I think is a mistake, yeah. as you can tell from my tone of voice. Yeah. Okay. Enough, Who else has got a question? Enough said. Yeah. Sir. <laughs> so I have, this is twofold. Excuse me? This twofold. Question. This question is twofold. Twofold. So the first question, first part is definitely for you, Ms. Townsend. Um, our beloved Frederick Douglass said it is easier to build strong children to repair broken men. What is your message to our babies today that are living in a world where history is being erased in the news lines ahead of them? To you, Mr. Doar, um, I find it to be very interesting that um, a think tank on the conservative side of America is the group that's holding this conversation today. And I commend you for that. However, when we leave this building, we know the world that we live in. What is your message to your party today that is not the party of Lincoln? Uh, uh, you the first part was directed to you. What was it? I thought he looked at Robert. Yeah, look at yeah. Okay. I, look at so, I guess right. I should put my glasses yeah, on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. You, you okay, could, Robert, why don't you take the sec second part? So first of all, thank you. Um, uh, I want to be clear about sort of AI, the leadership of AI's view of, of this gathering. We just felt that the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington was worthy of a conversation. And then it is true that because of my background, I, I had a way of doing it, but I, you know, this is not comprehensive. There are other voices, there are other leaders, there are other people that should also be part of this conversation and should be having their own conversations. Um, and I don't think that there's any contradiction really, honestly, in AI, which believes in freedom and believes in America and believes in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the 14th Amendment, uh, for us to celebrate that because the values of the march are very consistent with the values of AEI. So that's, that's the simple part. On the second part, um, there are aspects of our current conservative world right now that are broken and divided against each other. And AEI's role is to have independent scholars who work here contribute to that debate in a positive, productive way. And every day, a scholar at AEI put something out in some component of the debate. 
And that's what we do. I don't take a position in AI, an official position. We let our scholars speak for themselves. And I think if you look at all of their work, you all live in, um, uh, Chris Scalia is here, Michael Strain, Christine Rosen, Rui Teixeira, who we mentioned, you'll see that their voices on a variety of issues are contributing constructively to that debate. And, um, and the last thing I'll just say is, is I'm not quite so clear that when it comes to race in America, I'm absolutely not clear at all that the Republicans are all wrong and the Democrats are all right. I don't think that's true. I think it's more complicated than that. And there are good voices on both sides. And, and there are harmful voices on both sides. And so we try to be part of the good voices, adding constructively to the debate. Ka Kathleen, I think the first part of the question for you was, what would you tell young people uh, at a moment when some people uh, are, uh, have a, seem to have a desire to obscure some of the history of the civil rights movement? Yes, sir. Well, it, I'm telling you what I did, which is, I, as you, as what I did in Maryland is get kids to do community service, everybody to act, um, and everybody to learn values. And in the learning of action and values, they can, we should also learn history. And, um, and I think it's really important in learning history. <laughs> but, uh, look, I love history. Um, now I'm going to say something else. I'm moving on. The interesting thing about the United States, I, that was my major, American history and literature. The interesting thing about the United States is they don't, most Americans don't know much history. That's, that's our tradition. Unlike Europe, we're not, except for, the, except for the Civil War, most Americans don't know any history at all. Just kind of interesting. And so they're not usually refighting wars and things that they did 20 years ago, five years ago. A lot of people don't know who John Kennedy is or Robert, or Robert they certainly don't know who Robert Kennedy is. Uh, uh, when the Berlin fell down, Berlin Wall fell down, somebody called my husband who teaches at St. John's College they didn't know who he was. He just they thought he was a professor. And he said, oh, you should talk to my wife. Why? Well, she's related to uh, John Kennedy. Well, who's he? Uh, uh, <laughs> OK. Well, he had something to do with the Berlin Wall. OK. <laughs> OK. I'm just giving you how little. And he was a reporter for a paper, which I won't name. But you've heard of it. My only point is there's a lot of non of people that don't know history. So part, and that might be kind of valuable in America. In, in other words, I know this is not really popular to think tank, but um, maybe what we should do is try to just create a future. And for those who want to learn history, we can teach them some history. And you can think of the 20 things that you want them to know. OK, I know that's really unpopular. but. It might be that's consistent with what America is. People want to know the future. And so maybe it's the most important do, thing we do is to create a future. My father would hate it if I said that. We were quizzed every night at dinner on what happened and then on history. So what I've said is really unpopular. But it is really hard right now. And we're fighting about history. So maybe we should just fight about how we're going to create a good future. All right. Uh, one final uh, comment I'd like to get from Fred, since your profession yes. has been invoked. Um, talk about uh, how you feel as you look at the future when you know that a lot of what Kathleen said is correct. And, and how, <laughs> how, um, said. how optimistic are you that? Events of this kind and uh, classrooms all around the country are going to be able to impart um, to the next generation what they ought to take from our, the past of the civil rights movement. You know, I'm ultimately optimistic about my adopted 
homeland. I'm from Sweden originally, but I'm, but this is now my home. And uh, I do think, John, that um, in time, um, we're going to work through the problems we have, which I think are really severe. There's no question, as Kathleen says, that, that teaching and that history has a role to play. My students are a somewhat unique demographic. I mean, they come, they come to Harvard, the undergraduates and the graduate students, with, and, 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 and it's a self-selecting group that I teach, meaning they have an interest in history, often a great knowledge of history. And so it's really inspiring to be their teacher. Um, so in that sense, I'm also optimistic about what young people want and what they want to see. And maybe I'll just finish, John, by going back to John F. Kennedy on this. I think the reason why Kennedy was so inspirational, inspirational to so many people and why people in the summer of 63, even before his assassination, more Americans claimed to have voted for him in 1960 than actually did vote for him in 1960 is because of a message that he conveyed both before he was in the White House and after he was in the White House, which was uh, the things that unite Americans are more important than the things that divide Americans, which I think is important. And then, of course, we all associate with him with the idea that, and this is what they got from their parents, from Joe and Rose, you've got to give something back. Believe in something greater than yourselves. And so I would say, bringing the, the last two questions together in a sense, to, to, to convey to young people the importance of that notion. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It's just, it has more resonance, it seems to me, today than, than, than ever before. Can I just build on that? So remember I told you I got every person in Maryland to do community service. And why did I do that? Because every child then felt they were powerful. They chose a problem in their community, in their school, and I'm going to tell you a story. So I went into a school, a blue-collar school, and I said to the kids, what do you want to do? If you could change anything in your school or community, what would you like to do? And nobody answered. And finally, one ninth grader said, you see, Mrs. Townsend, we've been taught to be seen and not heard. And that's what I want to change that you can be seen and heard and make a difference. And so giving people a sense that they can be powerful, and so many young people don't feel from the communities that I care about. This did not happen in Roland, in parts of, anyway. But the kids that I want to touch is that they can, and then in doing what they want to do, you can teach them history when they do it, if you're a good teacher. But they ha it has to be a connected to, oh, what you're doing, to action. OK? Are you still happy with me? <laughs> Will you join me in thanking this terrific team? Thank you. Uh, and can I just say, uh, I also want to thank you, John, very much for doing this. This really terrific way of doing it. And Fred and Kathleen for coming. Our plan is to serve lunch now, and then we'll have a little break, get settled, and then Bob Woodson and I will have a conversation in a little bit. So thank you very much.
but we, you know, there's so much to cover, and as I said earlier, the, you know, you can't cover it all, it's not comprehensive, but this is an effort, and we wanted to, we wanted to have our great friend Bob Woodson come and reflect, uh, you know, Bob is, is one of the great leaders in efforts to help Americans of, of all races, but especially black Americans, and unlike so many of us, uh, and I don't want you to take this wrong, Bob, but you actually might have been around back then in 1963. I was around. And um, what I wanted to do, um, but first I just want to make sure that our audience knows who we're talking to, um, and the idea is in the, is in the program, but Bob is the founder and president of the Woodson Center, a nonprofit demonstration research organization supporting neighborhood-based initiatives to strengthen low-income communities. A longtime civil rights leader, he led the National Urban League's Administration of Justice Division before becoming a resident fellow at AEI in the 1970s. So you're a, a returning alumni, an old friend, and we appreciate you being here. Um, I wanted to start uh, our conversation uh, just with a sort of a, let's get back to Dr. King and tell us about your ob observations of him then and your view of, of, of him as a leader and as, a, as, a, as, a, as an American. Well, thank you. I, uh, uh, people think about King in his I Have a Dream speech. But the one that stands out most for me is the letter from a Birmingham jail. Yes. Because Dr. King was a man exercised real le leaders, to me, are not always those who reflect popular opinion or the consensus of the majority but they're willing to challenge that consensus. Right. And Dr. King was a man who challenged orthodoxy because the other civil rights leaders criticized him for that speech, said you're going to alienate the white leadership. When he said in that, in that letter from Birmingham that, that the biggest stumbling block to black progress is not the white citizens council or the KKK, it is the white moderate. That lukewarm acceptance from people of goodwill is more difficult to tolerate than outright rejection of people of ill will. That got him into a lot of trouble. The second thing he did is when he took his position bringing the civil rights movement together with the peace movement. I was in Darby, Pennsylvania in a dinner with Roy Wilkins who was the major speaker and Roy Wickham just ripped him apart and I almost stormed off of the dais uh, and, and then Carl Rowan, Washington Post reporter, described King as a communist for bringing these movements. But again, the leadership opposed King, but the majority of black America rose up and supported him as well as myself. I was anti-war also. And so that's another uh, an example uh, of, of King. Also, is little known, uh, Eugene, that he also challenged Jameson at the National Black Baptist Convention, one of the largest gathering of black preachers. King ran against him because the National Baptist Convention was opposed to civil disobedience. And King ran against him and lost. And as a consequence, he and Y.T. Walker split and the fabs, the, the, what is it, the Progressive Baptist Convention, and that split exists today. So people don't realize that the civil rights movement had its own Tea Party revolution inside. That's where there was a splintering because debate was critical at that time. So King was the leader of, of, of a man who, who didn't just wait to take popular positions, but he was a challenger, and that's what I respect most about him. Yeah, and I think the, I might be wrong about this, but the letter from Birmingham Jail is famous for why we cannot wait. And also this, this reflection on it's not, it's not the other advocates who we got to worry about. It's the vast group of people that sit on their hands and, are, and let things happen to them. We've got to motivate them and we've got to push them. I think that's a, a really great point. And of course, and also the resistance he faced within the movement. The, the, Wilkins was all, not always easy with him. A, Randolph, the head of the, the labor union, and the, wasn't always easy. And he had to challenge them in order to become leader that he was. But he was also challenged by the students. Remember that the, the principal the principal strategy was legal, file lawsuits. And then the students at Greensboro got tired of that and had to sit in. But King was sent from Atlanta to tell the students to stop this civil disobedience. 
And so when the students, uh, King confronted the students, they said, either lead, follow, or get out the way. Yeah. And King wisely decided to lead. <laughs> <laughs> he was also sent to Montgomery to discourage Rosa Parks from what she did as well. In fact, he was not welcomed by the leadership, by the leaders or the pe preachers. It was the students who came out and supported King uh, in him. And, and so, again, King was always willing to, to lead by listening <laughs> and learning and listening to those he was leading to make sure he was reflecting their will and not just his own. And that's what made him so an uh, important figure. So one of the things in your writing we've observed over the years is that, that you, do, you do have the view that, that um, something happened to the civil rights movement after the march and in the later part of the 60s as certain um, issues became uh, high profile, like uh, busing. And you've also been known to write about the difference between being against segregation and being for integration. So, yeah. so let's just talk to me about how the movement evolved and maybe I'm, mention those issues. I'm really 25 years old, going to Westchester, Pennsylvania, just graduated from University of Penn School of Social Work, got in back in civil rights movement. And um, I, was, I deposed a 40-year-old Bill Johnson who was leading the movement, very autocratic, and so I, was an upstart young man, and I challenged him and one leadership of the, and most of the people are 15 years older than me, and I'm 25. But I, but it, but I it was very interesting, but I began to uh, uh, lose confidence in the movement on the issue of busing. I was adamantly opposed to busing. I believe that the opposite of segregation is not integration, it's desegregation. I was on Meet the Press, with Johnny Cochran and uh, uh, Jesse Jackson, and this came up. And Tim Russell said, oh, Mr. Woodson, if you're against uh, uh, segregation, uh, I mean, integration, you must be for segregation. I said, it's a false dichotomy. That the opposite of segregation is desegregation. The goal is pluralism. In the, uh, integration is an integral part. I thought it was wrong for us to argue in 1954 that suffrage is inherently unequal it is strategically unequal. But we didn't argue that point. When you argue something is, is, is inherently unequal, you're saying anything that's all black is all bad. And so, that, uh, <clears throat> and so that's when I got in trouble. They said, well, Bob, your position is consistent with that of the Klan and the John Birch Society. I said, Hitler likes classical music. Am I not supposed to not like it? Yeah. I don't take my positions based upon who agrees or disagrees. It has to be what side is truth on. And truth for me at the time was what? In fact, I got into this debate with uh, Julius Chambers, a Harvard lawyer, uh, head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. We debated uh, school integration before the New York Bar Association. And I'm a non-lawyer, a C student. <laughs> and so uh, midway through the debate, I said, Julius, we have two circumstances. School A is all black where there's a presence of excellence. School B is integrated where there's diminished excellence. Where should we send our children? He said to school B. I said, we don't have any debate. If you honestly believe that sitting next to white people and integrated is more important than excellence, I said, if you pursue excellence, and, and, and people will come to you, like Marva Collins in, in Chicago, who taught school and she was teaching kids who were challenged, and she was successful at teaching kids who were, being, who were the public school couldn't, white parents from the suburbs began to bring their children to her school. So if you create a center of excellence, the, the, the byproduct of pursuing excellence will be integration. And that's how integration uh, could follow. Jews wanted Brandeis and Yeshiva, but they all wanted Harvard and Yale. Blacks, we left our institutions because uh, and we integrated ourselves out of our own businesses, too. And so it is important at that time, but uh, it would met with st stiff resistance. The other point that caused me to leave the, the movement was on the whole class issue. I led a demonstration against Wyatt Laboratories in <clears throat> Westchester, 
And on the picket line were janitors, people who worked in factories. And when they desegregated, they hired nine black PhD chemists. And when we asked them to join that movement, they said they got to school, they were qualified, not because of the sacrifices of the people on the line. Well, then I realized that there was a bait and switch going on, that they used the demographics of the poor blacks and then promote remedies that only help those at the top. And so I realized then that any time you generalize about a group of people and then try to apply remedies, you always benefit those who are at, at the top versus those at the bottom. And so, but again, this got me mm -hmm. in conflict with the movement. So um, I, after I, and it just came home to me when I was leaving the movement and when Dr. King got killed, and Westchester started to blow up, and they called me and said, Bob, you got to get back here. The city is ready to burn. And when I got in my car to drive the 10 miles back to Westchester, I didn't knock on the doors of the civil rights officials. I went to the streets, the people that I knew who were bartenders, people who I knew had moral authority on the streets. And 10 of us got in cars and interposed ourselves between the National Guard and the police. And we prevented anybody from dying in that day. But I also realized the civil rights movement was really not representing a large number of poor blacks. So from that day, they formed their own organization. And we told people to come to the community center as opposed to rioting. They had 500 blacks sitting in there. They said, we want you to be our leader. I said, no, I'm not the one who had the influence. You do. I will help you to develop. And so that's finished me. When, and so from that point on, I began to work on behalf of low income people of all races, that the biggest problem we have in America is not we have a crisis, not of race, but of grace. So I, I began to change. So and one of the words in, in your bio that is an important word, and, and, and it's going to come back to a discussion of the great society and the way those post-Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act legislation was put together. And I, I might say that your history of writing felt that in great ways the Great Society legislation was written from Washington and sort of cut the neighborhood out. And you had an ally in that in Robert Kennedy, who also uh, wasn't happy with the Great Society uh, uh, aspects of anti-poverty program of uh, President Johnson and wanted to do a neighborhood-based uh, effort in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. So I, I throw that in as a, as a sidelight, but I want to ask you, have I got that right? Is, is there a sense about the neighborhood, the community, the local activity that's more important to you than what is happening in Washington? See, what happened when the, the, when the civil rights movement, um, uh, when we had a... Um, a one second. But we had the civil rights movement came together, um, and there was a, that the, the question when I'm sorry when King was asked that the civil rights depend upon protest. It had to have a Bull Connors. We were an opposition movement. We were against thing, and we're clear. There's always a. But when King decided to take it to the north and go to Chicago and John, and, and Mayor Daley, uh, unlike Bull Connors. He shut the city down, called his cabinet together, and said to Dr. King, OK, what's your agenda? And Dr. King wrote, where do we go from here? Well, where do we go from here was never answered by the civil rights, because they had no proactive agenda. And so what happened when after this Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act was passed, Eight liberal white men sat on the eighth floor of the Justice Department and crafted the war on poverty. And that was given to the civil rights leadership, who were then leaving civil rights and joining the Democratic Party. Uh, and so they were the ones who administered the $22 trillion that the poverty program could. And the way the poverty, the first year of the program, I was in Pasadena, California, working for the grassroots group. The first year of the poverty program, it really did hire grassroots leaders. But these leaders began to challenge local or public officials about their policies. And so what they did at OEO, Office of Economic Opportunity, they changed the rules. They said any community outreach worker has to have a bachelor's degree. 
that one act uh, uh, changed the whole nature of the poverty program and, it be, and, and, it, and the whole program, the 22 trillion over the last 50 years. <clears throat> 70 cents of every dollar we spent on the poor didn't go to the poor. It went to those who served the poor. They asked not which uh, problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. So we created a commodity out of the poor. Um, and where and, and, and the civil rights leaders, the mayors, were in charge of running it. Now, this is how they structured the program. They came up with something called maximum feasible participation. Who's going to manage the money when it gets to the local level? They said one-third of, the, of these poverty boards, local, would be public officials, the other third business, and the other third grassroots people. Well, guess who chose the grassroots vote? And so what happened, you have massive corruption where business leaders were charging daycare three times what the market would bear, and, poverty, and, and many of the civil rights leaders' friends and relatives went to work for these programs, and many of them, again, operated against the issue, I mean, uh, uh, interests of low-income people because, remember, middle-class people were seeking entry into these government programs. One other fact is important when we talk about structural racism. I say it's structural incompetence. Two out of 10 whites with college education works for government. Six out of 10 blacks do. So our middle class is anchored in a section of our economy that needs poor people in order for them to prosper. So you have people's strategic interests hostile to the interests of another group, but we, but we ought to be debating that. We ought to be discussing it, but it's not. And we also need to be debating the way we used to between the Panthers and the Republic of New Africa, the Muslims, and all. that was healthy. There is none of that today. We need to be debating why are black people failing in systems run by their own people when the great promise was elect us to office and conditions will improve. Well, race is used as a shield and a spear. A shield so these kind of questions won't be raised and a spear against anyone who raises them. So tell me about one of the things I've liked in my conversations with you over the years, Bob, is that you do stress the, not the victims but the successes the people in the neighborhoods and the communities who have transformed their lives or transformed your neighborhoods. And do you want to just tell us a little bit about them or where has it worked? Where has this, this, this uh, local initiative or effort been successful and, 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 and how do you characterize it? The, uh, the, <clears throat> the Woodson Center was just named just six years ago, not because my ego demanded it, but because our <clears throat> consultants told us that my name is more associated with the principles than the Woodson, than Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. But the reason that we had enterprise so long, because we believe that the principles in the market economy should apply to the social economy. Only 3% of the people, according to David Birch at MIT, 3% of our population are entrepreneurs, but they generate 70% of all the jobs. And entrepreneurs tend to be C students, not A students. A students come back to university, C students come, no, A students come back to universities and teach, C students endow. <laughs> 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 because smart people have to have all the answers before they act, and when they act, the opportunity's gone. The C students, like myself, we can fail, come back, try it again, fail, come back, and then we're successful. Well, grassroots people, too, are to me, are th that it only takes a small number of innovative people who've learned how to turn gang members into ambassadors of peace. And what we do at the Woodson Center is come into those communities, and we don't, we don't apply a deficit model. People, you, you'll be hard pressed to go into any low income community and tell me which political philosophy is in place, or which political party is. It doesn't matter, because both of them treat them as, as aliens or victims. Conservatives, as Bill Bennett said, when, when liberals see poor people and, 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 and blacks, they see a sea of victims, and conservatives see aliens. And so it is, in, it is important 
for us, when we're looking for solutions to, again, apply the... We go into the, the low-income neighborhoods. If you say 70% of the people are raising children that are dysfunctional, it means 30% are not. How many studies have we seen on either left or right that goes into the 30% of the households to find out how are people ma ma managing to raise children successfully that are not dropping out of school or in jail on drugs? So what the center does is go in and find these, the, these people, and then we, we, we treat them. We're kind of like a venture capitalist without capital. <laughs> we have to recruit it, but it should not be recruited from government. We look for wealthy individuals that we call pharaohs, because the foundation of what the center does is from Genesis. Joseph, as you know, was from a dysfunctional Hebrew family. But he also was, was, was sold into slavery by his family and jailed by the, by the Egyptians. But he was faithful to his God even in his oppression and refused to give in to despair or anger. And so when he was blessed, uh, Pharaoh, it was a powerful man who was able to bad, dream bad dreams in good times. But he was also able to look beyond race and ethnicity and class and call upon this 31-year-old uneducated Hebrew for the answers. And to me, that's what we must do today, that we must, what the Woodson Center does, is go around the country looking for faith-centered pharaohs who understand that the, the, the plight of this country is going to depend on developing, looking to, for unusual, exciting examples of, of excellence among the most downtrodden. The Bible unusual, says, go exciting, among the, Unusual, exciting examples of excellence yes. among the most downtrodden. Exactly. And raise them up. And raise them up uh, and to, to, to inspire. This is what, Bob, in our book, uh, 1776, that's what's so troubling today that, we're, that, that, that race has just captured us to the point. But Delano Spears, I have to give him the best way to describe it. He says, all these initials are being driven by a small group of elite, guilty white people who are seeking absolution from crimes they never committed. And elite blacks who are seeking absolution from injustice they never suffered. They are the ones driving the narrative that the biggest problem America should be. But the, but, but the reservoir of patriots, well, who's going, the group that's going to save America are these low-income black groups. The Woodson Center has about 3,500 in, uh, in 39 states. They're black, white, brown. In 43 years of convening people, when we get together, racial animus is never discussed. Why? Because 80% of our closest friends have letters in front of their names, not behind them. The ex something, ex drug addicts, ex thief, that God has delivered them, and therefore they are a rich source of innovation. And, and so, what we must do is to promote them so that they can begin to inform us. Okay, so the, uh, that leads me to the last question before I open it up to the group. So, get ready with any questions for Bob. Um, in one of your writings, you write about uh, transformation and redemption, uh, what, we, what, what people need or what we need in order to move forward is, is I mean, maybe it's as an individual. But what do you mean by that? What, 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 is, what is that? What mean? I mean is that people are motivated to change and improve when you show them victories that are possible, not injuries to be avoided. And so the biggest uh, charge against America is that it's because of slavery and, race and, and Jim Crow Somehow the legacy of those are what's causing the pathology, that widespread pathology you see in the black community. Well, we at the Woodson Center, we, we, we challenge that, that lie that the president, I'm, 30, I'm 86 years old. I was born in 1937 in a low-income segregated community in, in South Philadelphia. But in that environment, we were all low-income people. 96% of all households had a man and a woman raising children. 
Elderly people could walk safely without fear of being assaulted by their grandchildren. Children were not shot in their cribs. And I never heard a gunfire. I could go on a date on a Friday night and leave the movie and sit on a public park bench with my girlfriend without fear of being assaulted. In other words, what we documented in our analysis is that when whites were at their worst, we were at our best. Those same schools that Ian talked about, people are failing. Well, well, we had five major high schools at the turn of the century in New York, Baltimore, Washington, Atlanta, and New Orleans. They, the kids went to crumbling uh, uh, buildings where they had used textbooks, half the budgets of white schools. And every one of those high schools, black high schools, they out-tested the white schools in their same city. In those same schools today, barely 10% couldn't even pass a basic reading test. So how can anybody contend that what we're facing today is institutional racism? I don't even know what that is. I asked one of the people on the left, I said, if we were able to achieve that, the golden 13, 1943, blacks were not naval officers. So Eleanor Roosevelt persuaded her husband to train. So they took 16 black high school, uh, I mean, college trained men and trained them as naval officers. But the Navy said, aha, we're going to give them in eight weeks what we gave our white cadets 16 weeks. So these brothers didn't contest it. What they did was cover their windows and studied. And when they were tested, they scored in the 90th percentile. So the, they said, oh, they cheated. So they tested them individually. Second time, 90th, third percentile. 13 went on to become naval officers. And as a consequence, uh, the whole thing changed. If, and, and there are endless other examples of how blacks were able to close the education gap in the South between 19... Uh, 20 and 1940, it was three years, eight, eighth, eighth grade for whites, fifth grade for blacks. But because of the, the establishment of 5,000 Rosenwald Booker T schools, that education gap closed within six months in less than 20 years. The highest marriage rate uh, of the blacks had in between 1930 and 1940 when racism was enshrined in law. And if we could close the education gap in 1920 to 40, if we have the highest marriage rate during the Depression, if we were denied access to hotels and businesses, yet we developed uh, five hotels in the Wallahaji in Atlanta, the Carver and Calvert Hotels in Miami, the St. Teresa in, in Chicago, I mean, in, in New York, the St. Charles. In, I can go on and on. When in, in the Bronzeville section in our essays of Chicago, where there's so much mayhem today, in 1919, we had 731 black-owned businesses, 100 million in real estate assets, when we were being redlined. The question that we need to discuss and debate today, if blacks achieved under segregation and Jim Crow, the kind of advancements that we did, why can't we do it today? But nobody, uh, the current leadership in civil rights, as far as I'm concerned, civil rights well, leadership has abandoned any one, pretext of being well, representative of black people. One aspect of hope on that, I just wanted to call your attention to the charter school movement at its best, or the choice movement at its best, which are often uh, overwhelmingly low income, African-American, Hispanic kids. And for instance, in New York City, with rigor and discipline and parental involvement, Absolutely. they are outperforming exactly. every school in New York State. Yeah. So it, it's not just a story from ancient history, Bob. Right. It is happening today. And, and I think that, that sometimes when we only talk about, we don't realize it's right in front of us if we it just It really try. is. We, we for instance, the, 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 you can go on 60 Minutes, I mean on YouTube, and put in the names Bertha Gilkey, 60 Minutes. We worked with a group in, in Cochrane and St. Louis where the residents went in and cleaned out everything and they began to run it. They brought about peace 
Kimmy Gray, right here in Washington, we worked for uh, 14 years with her. She said, in one of the worst, most violent public housing development, when the residents took a charge, the Josephs, they sent 680 kids to, public to college from this one public housing development, eliminating teen pregnancy. The Piney Wood School, a 115-year-old institution in Jackson, Mississippi, has, has thrived and it maintains it's, it's, a, it's a, it a black boarding school where a mandatory chapel, uh, yeah. mandatory work, they draw from the same uh, demographic that the LeBron James school does. And then they said Le LeBron James three schools, not one black, uh, one eighth grader even passed a basic math test in three years. But Pineywood School, 96% of the kids from the same demographic go on to college from the Piney Wood School. You see, yeah. we ought to be rushing in as conservatives. We ought to be rushing in and, 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 and pouring resources in. But, but, but to our point, the way we believe at the Woodson Center, we, we, we push against this attack on our values is support those individuals who embody those values in the actions that they take to rescue and redeem their community. Okay. And, and that's how we can make our case. In other words, experience to me will, will always prevail against an argument. And a witness is more powerful than an advocate. So what I believe what's going to save this country are low-income blacks because are the people that we serve, they ain't confused about their pronouns. OK. All right. So with that, we're going to take a couple questions from the audience. And then we're going to finish with a message from Reverend Rivers. Yes, sir. Wait for the mic. Do we need to? Stand up for a center. You just tell us who you are and a question, oh. not a statement. Oh, exactly. Thank you. Uh, Leon, please. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess I'm concerned. I'm from uh, the Montgomery County, Maryland area. And um, my concern is that uh, as I observe it today, the country is under a, um, has a new concern with the influx of, uh, we have new, new arrival people and levels of poverty far below anything that we've had traditionally. How do you propose that we address uh, those issues, preparing those students, those families, to have a successful integration into our society, especially when many are unfamiliar with our educational structure? Those two immigration questions. You know, I think it's a shame that, you know, the <clears throat> in the past, Slave owners looked at blacks and poor people as property. Today, many progressives look at them as pawns. And we really are pitting the interests of one against the other. And I think the crisis that's being created by these crazy open borders policies that are flooding people in without any regard to who they are and what they're doing is really exacerbating the problem. But we shouldn't have to choose between serving the people who have been here who are citizens to accommodate people who are not. And many of them are abusing the privileges and even robbing and stealing in New York and creating chaos among the low-income people there. And that's going to create the kind of rebellion that you're seeing. That, so, so I just think it's crazy for us to, no one, we should not have open borders. Next question from over here. Yes, sir. Right here. Thank you so much. Paul Edwards, Wheatley Institute at Brigham Young University. A um, question was asked earlier about how do we actually promote marriage? You've given us some good examples about how to promote education. Uh, what do you see currently working that helps to support and sustain a culture of increased marriage and marriage fidelity in the communities that you're working with. Here again, 
when I'm looking for solutions, I go into the communities to find, to ask people in those communities. When I went to Pastor Freddy Garcia in Jubal, who run Outcry in the Barrio, this is a faith-based drug and recovery program that has reached thousands of people, helping them to re become redeemed. And what they have found as a consequence of them teaching this, that marriages are beginning to spontaneously occur among this population. And so what we do is go in and ask those couples, what is it that caused you to want to marry? But Freddie places some restrictions. He said, when you marry someone, you're also marrying their children. So before you can actually tie the knot, you have to spend so many weekends with the children of those that you uh, are, are, are married. So these kinds of, of, of experiences, we go around the country and go into uh, these communities to ask the real experts of how people have transformed their community. Pastor Shirley Holloway here has the same experience. Uh, young gang members, we, the Woodson Center uh, has been involved with gang intervention. Benning Terrace, an area 25 years ago, 55 murders in a five square block area because of warring factions. We trained some five men who had moral authority, went and brought those kids into our office and they, they converted them from predators to ambassadors of peace and went back into the same community without a single gang murder for 12 years, but down. But we also mentored them. My wife here will tell you that we have taken five of these young men out to dinner so they can see a man and a woman with children and my son and his family. So they saw two generations having dinner. So we witnessed to these young people and now Derek Ross, uh, who headed the, the Circle Gang, is married to Kanisha, who was the 640 Honey Gang leader, and they've been married now for 22 years. So Derek and Kanisha become powerful witnesses to their peers. So when we talk about marriage, we bring Darius and Dar Wayne, and we take some of these people who were providing leadership in the negative to, to explain to kids why marriage is so important. So, so, uh, so that's a long-winded saying is we're looking in the wrong places for the right answers. But we, we need to look at low-income people as a source of solution and not stop looking at the pathology. Okay, we're going to take one more question, and then um, I want to let you know that um, a little story about our next speaker, and then we will uh, conclude with his remarks. So any more questions for Bob? Okay. All right. Let me look. Let me get ready for it. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's not gonna. I'm not gonna make you jump. Gonna I'm gonna start nothing. Um, Mr. Wilson, thank you for everything. My question to you is: It go. I'm going back to Douglas. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. How do we combat the imagery of the media? Because that is the biggest opposition to those good family references, those good familial points, the great stories, that is the greatest opposition to the imagery of the Bible, that is the greatest opposition to the things we try to do in church and in neighborhoods and social workers. Imagery in the media, our music, social media, TV, movies, books, everything. How do we combat wow. that powerful imagery with this good wholesomeness feel good stuff that you're talking about. What we're doing is at the Woodson Center is that we have a whole uh, PR plan to do that. In fact, we have in our book 1776 and I read white and black rescuing America from uh, racist hustlers and revisionists. But also in our essays, we're telling the stories of both past and present. We've had like 110,000 downloads of the curriculum but we also have a lot of videos that we're producing where we're taking you into the communities and celebrating uh, the, the accomplishments of people. Uh, so we need a whole investment in a strategy to counter uh, with, with, with positive parables that highlights the, the success of people in the presence of... Uh, the other piece that we've got to do is in terms of... 
the Woodson Center is working with Pepperdine University to establish the Center for the Study of Resilience. We need to have a whole study where we, we, we talk about the resilience, where uh, the opposite of this pathology. And so what we need to invest as much money is promoting positive uh, stories on the internet and, and whatnot. So we just need to have a counter, uh, a counter uh, strategy uh, to promote it. But we need investment in it. And this is what, when I look at the amount of money being invested in these campaigns, political campaigns, it just blows my mind. Millions here on an ad campaign. <coughs> A million, kid kid, a million dollars invested in Pontywood School means 50 children can be rescued from these neighborhoods and give a chance of life. A million for 50 kids. And so whenever I hear that, I'm saying, we need to change the way we invest. We need to invest in the whole process of redemption. America is a country of redemption. In, in my word to black folks, Y'all need to leave white folks alone for two years and talk about the enemy with them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, very much. Um, so as I began to think about this event some time ago, I uh, uh, sought out the counsel of my friend uh, Eugene Rivers. And he is our next speaker. He is the founder and director of the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies. Reverend Rivers has a long history of faith-based intellectual leadership on great challenges affecting African Americans, including gang violence. Reverend Rivers. Where you go? Here All right. Go. Okay. All right. All right. Let him have. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to be a preacher you love. <laughs> In that, I am going to exhibit the soul of brevity. The hour is late. Y'all are tired, and if you know anything about black preaching. The preacher knows how to read the house. That's one, that's, that's one of the, the gifts of a really good speaker, right? That you, you get up, you're at the pulpit, you, you size the crowd up, and you, you can conclude, okay, how are we gonna bring this thing home? And so I've been actually just called to bring it on in and to close this thing up with a couple of very brief remarks. So this will be, uh, a fairly concise benediction. Um, I want, I, I, I of course, uh, I'm thankful to the, the father of the house for the convening of this event. And I just wanna leave with you some important aspects of this discussion that need to be engaged. Um, uh, this has been an, an extraordinary gathering, I'm thankful, but more importantly, as we conclude, I want to suggest something to all of us. Having had a productive conversation, we now must look to the future. Intellectually, strategically, politically, a younger cohort needs to be assembled to learn from what has been said and to help these young people chart the future. What that means for me practically at the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies, we are organizing a, uh, a, a major event uh, where we talk about uh, the sons of Issachar. In the Old Testament, the sons of Issachar were those men that were chosen by the leadership because they understood the signs of the times and they knew what to do. And they had been trained. The black community needs some sons of Issachar with a 30 year vision. Now, this is a heavy thing here now. I'm gonna bring this thing in, y'all. A 30 year vision. Um, uh, Daniel Bell in 1967 organized a major conference which resulted in a a, uh, 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 the American Academy. Now, Yuval Levine knows all this stuff because he's a genius, right? He convened uh, a major meeting, and watch me now, uh, uh, to plan. Now, this is 67. And Daniel Bell, who was still at Columbia, convened a meeting to project for 2000. In 67, 
They was planning for, 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 for 2,000. And I said to myself, Lord, have mercy. These, these white boys ain't playing. Look at this. They up here, boy, and they got a long vision, you see. And, and in this context, there must be a vision that has the ability to uh, uh, engage in inter the intergenerational transmission of basic principles. We, we're celebrating uh, the March on Washington uh, just parenthetically. Part of what uh, 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 Lieutenant Governor uh, Kennedy talked about you know, is deeper than she may realize in that a major part of the difficulty in the movement was its secularization. The movement was born in faith in faith traditions. That was the, the philosophic, political, theological basis and the glue which enabled them, watch this, to have the faith to confront de death itself. We now have to have a project that is post-secular, but in a sophisticated way. I'm not talking about Trump, white, fundamentalist, Christian nationalism. All right, I just want to let y'all know that, that's, that, 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 that just, just in case you had any questions about my orientation. What is required is a vision that provides a framework because there is a book that's just recently come out uh, written by a man who is to the left. So, of course, he's a, a person of disreputable repute. Uh, the title of the book is the Point of No Return by Thomas Burton Etzel. Now, I want all you brilliant hardline conservatives to give it a, a reading with a cold eye so there can be a dialogue and a discussion about where we are because the key point of Etzel's analysis, which is compilation of all kinds of comparative studies on levels of polarization in society, and the one finding that he has is that, unfortunately, given all of the enormous wealth of this country, we are experiencing some of the highest levels of group, inter-ethnic, racial, socioeconomic polarization in the world. To uh, Lieutenant Kennedy's point, we have to resurrect a rational vision of faith. So with that said, y'all, because we, we're getting ready to go home, the question before us comes out of uh, the third uh, chapter of the book of Ezekiel, where the writer says, 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 I have called on you to be a watchman. And the purpose of the watchman, because this theme of watchman is another way of saying, I was calling upon the intellectuals, the wise men, the seers, uh, the ones that provide leadership, he says, I've called upon you to call upon your countrymen and warn them of what is to befall them. The faith communities with intellectual and policy uh, sophistication must function as the wise men for a society that is, whose polarization is being accelerated by the hour. And I want to thank you, the leaders of this meeting, because you, by setting an example, are providing the kind of leadership which will help us avoid the terrible consequences of levels of polarization that are not challenged. I thank God for this. I thank God for you. And as they say in the hip-hop world, I will now drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs>